Good morning, everyone. I'm Millie Hong, Head of Events at ASIFMA. Thank you for joining us today at this virtual event, Malaysia Eyeball Transition. Let me introduce our host today, Ms. Rebecca Weinrock, Executive Director, Head of Fixed Income of ASIFMA. Rebecca, over to you, please. Thank you, Millie. We're delighted to have such a large audience today um, with people joining us from all over Malaysia. Before we start, I would like to thank our co-host, the Financial Markets Association of Malaysia, lead sponsor, ENY, gold sponsor, Refinitiv, and our endorser, ICMA, for their tremendous support. We are also delighted to have members uh, in our audience from the Central Bank of Malaysia, the Malaysia Association of Banks, Association of Investment Banks, the Association of Islamic Banks, the Malaysia Association of Corporate Treasurers, and the Federation of Investment Managers in Malaysia in our audience today. Uh, before we get started, I'm going to take you through a quick walk of our agenda. Um, we're going to start with welcoming remarks um, from Kakwei Chu, President of the Financial Markets Association in Malaysia, as well as the Vice Chairman of ASIFMA. We're going to have a keynote uh, presentation from Assistant Governor Aziz from Bank Negara. I'm going to give a brief regional update of ASIFMA's activities. We're going to have a presentation from ENY partner Ho Lam Chan on the impact of IBOR transition on the local banking market. We'll have product presentations from ISDA, ICMA, and Clifford Chance. We will have um, an IBOR transition data and infrastructure presentation by Edmund Lee at Bloomberg. Then we'll have a panel, banking panel presentation on implementation issues given by Deutsche Bank, Maybank, and Standard Charter. And we'll conclude with local accounting issue, uh, presentation on accounting issues by ENY. Um, we, we will be taking questions. You can use your Q&A box at any time, um, and we will see if we can work the question into the program. So please do be involved. And so without further ado, let's welcome Mr. Kokwei Chu, President of the Financial Malaysia Association and Vice Chairman of ASIFMA. Mr. Chu, please. Thank you very much, uh, Rebecca and uh, Mili. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Asia Securities Industry and Financial Market Association, ASIFMA, and Financial Market Association of Malaysia, FMAN, I am glad to welcome all of you to ASIFMA virtual event on Malaysia eyeball transition, which is co-hosted by FMAN. Today, I have the unique privilege to speak on behalf of both ASIFMA and FMAN as the co-chair and president. Firstly, let me thank our guest of honor, Mr. Asnan Abdul Aziz, Assistant Governor of Bank Negara Malaysia, who will deliver the keynote address, sharing with us on his perspective of Malaysia eyeball transition progress and readiness, supervisory expectation and facilitation to prepare all stakeholders for the eventual cessation of LIBOR. At ASIFMA, we started preparing the Malaysian financial markets on IBOR transition with an event hosted by Bank Negara Malaysia back in July 2019 entitled Awareness on IBOR Transition together with ISDA, Bloomberg and FMAM. Despite the COVID-19 challenges, global and regional regulators persevere and intend to keep the IBO transition deadline intact. Apart from a Hong Kong-centric Asia-Pacific IBO transition event held in July this year in conjunction with the HKMA and the Malaysian event today, ASIFMA plans to conduct similar event for India, Thailand, Indonesia, Taiwan, Philippines, Vietnam, and Singapore in the coming months. This is where partnership with local association is key to ensure maximum outreach to key stakeholders and each country local nuances and specific challenges are addressed effectively. Co-hosted by the Financial Market Association of Malaysia, today's event 
received more than 550 registrations with participants from regulators, financial institutions, investing institutions, and of course, business corporations. At FMEM, we are proud to lead the effort with the support from Bank Negara Malaysia to prepare the financial market for this historic moment to transition beyond LIBOR. Industry initiatives, such as the preparation for average overnight interest rate, AOIR, as an alternative of near risk-free rate for Malaysian ringgit, adoption of announced international risk-free rates into the local market transactions, the launch of Malaysia cross-currency derivative products referencing the new international risk-free rates, education and training events as well to prepare all our stakeholders and keeping us engaged and busy for the coming months. On this front, I am very happy to announce that two of our member institutions of both ASIGMA and FMEM, the CIMB Bank and Standard Chartered, concluded the very first Malaysian Ringgit Klaibo to US dollar SOFA cross-currency basis swap trades recently, officially started the ball rolling on local transition from LIBOR to SOFA. Before I end, allow me to thank and congratulate Rebecca, Mili, and the events team at ASIFMA, together with Ms. Sylvia Wong, co-chair of FMM Education Committee and the financial market head of Standard Chartered Bank Malaysia, and of course, our Miss Carol Liu from FMEM for successfully organizing this virtual event. On this note, it is my great honor now to invite Assistant Governor Asnan to deliver his keynote address. AG, please go ahead. Okay, I think I figured out how to use this thing. Okay, thank you, uh, Kokwee, um, Rebecca, Mili, Asifma, and uh, FMM. Uh, congratulations on getting over 560 uh, registrations for this event. Uh, that makes me a little bit nervous, uh, but nonetheless, it's my pleasure to deliver the keynote address at this uh, eyeball transition virtual event, jointly organized by uh, FMM uh, and uh, Asifma. Uh, this event is very timely, uh, given that we are just uh, 15 months away from the cessation of LIBOR uh, and the clock is definitely ticking. Uh, and as we all know, uh, LIBOR will be discontinued uh, by the end of 2021 and replaced by alternative risk-free rates or RFRs, uh, such as the SOFA uh, in the US and the Sterling Overnight uh, Index Average in the UK. Uh, now, despite the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, the UK FCA as the regulator of LIBOR uh, has uh, again reiterated uh, that the timeline for the demise of LIBOR will not be delayed. Uh, and this pandemic has in fact uh, served to highlight the inherent weaknesses um, of LIBOR and underscores the urgency of finding suitable replacements. Um, the increase in credit uh, premium of banks during the pandemic uh, caused LIBOR rates to rise, diluting the impact of um, central bank uh, policy rate cuts to support the economy. Uh, this contrasts with replacement uh, risk-free rates, which do not include uh, banks' premium, uh, credit premium, and thus would be less uh, susceptible to uh, such volatility. And uh, as recently as in uh, March and April this year, uh, we saw a large volatility in LIBOR, and um, this is uh, observed due to falling uh, liquidity uh, and large-scale offerings of central bank facilities uh, such as repo and term uh, funding schemes at very attractive rates during the pandemic have caused uh, many banks to shy away from unsecured markets. And the dwindling uh, underlying transactions um, in unsecured markets only made LIBOR more vulnerable to liquidity effects uh, in financial markets. Therefore, it is imperative that uh, market participants seek to uh, gear up their efforts to reduce reliance on LIBOR and complete the transition to RFRs before December 2021. And globally, uh, the transition is well underway. Um, however, uh, progress has been slow, especially in, in uh, uh, non-LIBOR jurisdiction. And, and uh, I can say that this, this may be the case in, in Malaysia. Uh, and there is uh, much that we need to do. Uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, in, in Malaysia, there are about uh, 1.1 trillion worth of LIBOR exposures. Uh, 
uh, in financial contracts as of June uh, 2020. Uh, and transitioning this large amount will not uh, be easy. And many challenges uh, lie ahead for both banks and, and corporates. Legal challenges, valuation, accounting, uh, risk management and system investments, just to name a few, uh, presents many hurdles to be resolved. Um, and for today's keynote address, let me therefore highlight some of the key risks and challenges uh, in our journey. The first, of course, is the legal risk uh, associated with the re renegotiation of loan products between banks uh, and their customers. Derivatives, uh, although large in size and account for 76% of LIBOR exposures in, in Malaysia, uh, do not worry us as much, uh, fortunately, uh, as, this, as these contracts are standardized and development of a robust uh, fallback provisions are, are progressing and well underway. Um, via a global concerted efforts by ISDA, uh, who I believe uh, is sitting on a panel discussion uh, later today, uh, as we heard earlier. Um, loans, on the other hand, are more customized uh, to individual borrowers and therefore present uh, more complexities that would require bilateral negotiation between the bank and each of their borrowers. A common understanding uh, therefore needs to be reached on the alternative rates to be used and relevant fallback provisions incorporated into the existing LIBOR loan agreements. There will be a spread between existing LIBOR and the alternative risk-free rate, uh, and this could result in potential gain to one party of the transaction at the expense of the other. Um, for example, if the risk-free rate is lower than the existing LIBOR, then the borrower may gain from the lower rate of expense, uh, lower rate at the expense of his bank. Um, any potential transfer between uh, of value between parties of the transaction arising uh, from the transition to RFR may complicate contract renegotiation and pose legal taxation, reputational as well as economic risk to both parties unless a spread adjustment is made to offset the difference between RFR and LIBOR. Uh, the renegotiation will undoubtedly uh, take time uh, social distancing requirement during pandemic will uh, present additional challenges and therefore I, I cannot emphasize, emphasize enough uh, the urgency for both banks uh, and their customers to work together hand in hand uh, to ensure that all LIBOR reference loans are smoothly transitioned uh, to an alternative uh, RFR. Uh, banks and borrowers should exhaust every opportunity uh, to sit down and agree on transition terms. Although a regulatory approach may seem appealing at this point in time, uh, market participants should avoid relying on legislative solution as a way out, given that market participants uh, may have little or, or nothing to, uh, little to say uh, in any legislation, uh, legislated uh, contract terms to safeguard their best interests. And therefore, uh, the financial industry needs to intensify efforts to communicate to end users of LIBOR and ensure that they understand the need uh, and the timeline to move uh, to RFR. This webinar uh, is an excellent example of such effort. Acknowledging the importance of having clearly defined timeline uh, for the transition, Bank Negara Malaysia has drawn up a transition signposts, uh, a roadmap, if you will, to facilitate and expedite sectoral preparedness for the cessation of uh, LIBOR. I would expound the, uh, on the signposts post in the later part of my speech. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the second challenge facing the market uh, participants uh, is consumer conduct risk. While banks uh, prepare for the transition to risk-free rates, new contracts are constantly being uh, issued. Uh, should this continue to be based on LIBOR and mature after 2021, uh, a failure to properly disclose and educate borrowers on the transition to a risk-free rate may expose banks to significant uh, conduct risk and lead to adverse uh, reputational impact. Other risks uh, and impact of transition must also be given due consideration. These include banks' operational readiness, and system capability to support product reference to alternative RFRs, potential accounting, as well as tax implications, and the impact of changes to banks' risk management models that rely on LIBOR-based parameters. As corporations and uh, business entities are also uh, 
present uh, in this webinar, uh, I would like to take this opportunity to stress upon the role of non-bank uh, counterparties in ensuring uh, the industry makes smooth transition from LIBOR. So what must uh, non-financial institutions do? Uh, well, several things uh, come to mind. Uh, first, uh, obviously, is to speak to your bankers uh, with whom you have LIBOR loans. Uh, begin negotiations with the aim of incorporating fallback uh, positions in your loan contract that are maturing after 2021. Secondly, assess your internal systems to ensure that it is capable of supporting financial instruments, uh, reference to risk-free rates, and its computational method. Uh, for example, daily compounding in areas or simple uh, average of RFRs. Third, in addition to financial products, review existing commercial contracts which may have reference to LIBOR, for example, in liquidated uh, damages clauses. These contracts may pose legal risk to corporates when LIBOR is permanently discontinued. And last but not least, if you are planning to take new loans which will mature after 2021, uh, begin asking your banks for RFR-based products. This could begin to limit the pool of uh, contracts uh, referenced to LIBOR. Ladies and gentlemen, going back to the signpost uh, I mentioned earlier, we have observed that industry preparedness uh, remains uh, uneven. Larger banks or banks with an international presence are more prepared, while smaller ones are still at a nascent stage and adopting a, a wait and see approach. Thus, the signposts were created to streamline industry efforts and for us to track the progress better. In designing the signposts, uh, Bank Negara Malaysia took into consideration reprioritization of banking institutions, uh, business plans, and challenges in communicating with clients amidst uh, COVID-19. I will highlight the phases of this uh, signpost. The first, in quarter uh, three of 2020, which we are already in, uh, banks are expected to uh, have begun engaging uh, borrowers to renegotiate contracts and incorporate fallback provisions. In light of the need to observe social distancing during COVID, banks are encouraged to leverage on virtual engagement platforms to facilitate the discussion. Next, in quarter four, 2020, banks are expected to complete assessment on operational readiness and the capability uh, to support products referenced to RFRs. We expect the offering of new loans referencing RFRs to pick up as banks better understand their capability to support RFR-based products. By quarter two, 2021, all LIBOR loan uh, contracts must have a fallback provisions in place and banks' capability to execute fallback provisions must have already been tested and new issuances of LIBOR-based products must cease. And finally, in quarter three of 2021, any residual risk and impediments to issue products referenced to RFRs must be resolved before LIBOR ceases to exist uh, in December 2021. This signpost, uh, which I mentioned, can be found in our Financial Stability Review uh, 2019, which is published on our website. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, there are many challenges lining our path uh, to the end of December 2021, uh, with many issues to ponder uh, upon and to resolve. Uh, unfortunately, time is not on our side. Uh, with only 15 months to go, we cannot afford to be complacent. As I conclude, let me assure you that Bank Negara Malaysia uh, is deeply committed to ensuring a smooth transition from LIBOR to RFR uh, in Malaysia. However, this can only be achieved through the proactiveness of market participants, both banks and, and their counterparties, as well as regulators like us. With that, I wish you all a productive discussion in this webinar and thank you very much again to the organizer for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Aziz, for those very helpful comments about Malaysia's IBOR transition. $1.1 trillion in financial contracts to be transitioned is certainly a formidable task for all of us. Before we get into the Malaysia-specific substance that we'll be discussing during the rest of today's webinar, I wanted to highlight to you the work of ISIFMA and how you can use us as a resource in your transition process. We have published an IBOR transition guide. You can click it on the QR code on the screen. Um, in connection with ISDA, ICMA, and APLMA, and support from Deloitte 
and uh, Morgan Lewis. This guide provides a, an overview of key implementation issues to be considered by financial institutions in, pairing, in preparing for the LIBOR transition, and it should be of help to you in trying to meet your signposts here in Malaysia. Um, it includes a practical implementation checklist, which you can use either as a starting point for your IBOR transition journey if you haven't begun it yet, or as a way of making sure that you've kind of hit all your, 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 your hot buttons and your plan is comprehensive. Of course, each of your journeys will be very, very unique to your own customer base and product base, but a successful transition program should include program governance, transition management, communication strategy, process to identify and validate LIBOR-related exposure, a product strategy, a risk management review, uh, transition of existing and new contracts, operational and technology readiness assessments, accounting and reporting assessments, and of course, taxation assessments. Um, ASIFMA will be continuously surveying the financial community to identify external frictions that we worry may pose a challenge to IBOR readiness um, in, in both Malaysia and across Asia. And we will be shaping advocacy in this area going forward around their, these concerns. If you have issues that you worry are, are posing a, a challenge to your transition and you'd like to share them with us to see if they should, if it could be part of our advocacy plan, please do reach out. Finally, we will be producing webinars throughout the transition process. Today's webinar is an overview of the process in general, but as we move into more specifics and, and people begin to really um, roll up their sleeves and, and delve into the technical details, we'll be rolling out targeted webinars designed um, to help to help you and, and meet your, your signpost and, and understand um, how others are doing things. Now, I'd like to turn the program over to Hoi Lam Chan, a partner at EMY here in Malaysia, to give us an overview of the impact of IBOR transition on the local banking market. Thank you. Hoi Lam. Thank you, Rebecca. Thanks a lot, AG Asnan, for the comprehensive keynote address. Uh, I think Asan has shared with us uh, many impact on application. Uh, I will share from what we see as professional, as a person myself, uh, my team working with the banks here from the Malaysian perspective. Uh, actually, it started, uh, as you recall, since uh, 2012 when the LIBO integrity, the LIBO issue was revealed, right, in Europe. And we have seen in Malaysia what is happening in Europe. Uh, UK, UK authority have taken action, EU as well. And uh, five years later, in 2017, then we noted that announcement for LIBO is going to be replaced uh, by 2021. So, of course, Malaysia is affected, as, as all of us are aware. Uh, Malaysia is an important trading nation in the world, right? Uh, we do have investment out of and inside Malaysia, so we are exposed particularly on USD LIBO. At the same time, you know, uh, we have exports and imports. Of course, the banks are supporting the exporters and importers, uh, supporting the underlying transaction. At the same time, as all of us know that uh, either the banks and the exporter importer are doing hedging. So LIBO is very important to us, so it's affecting us uh, uh, quite greatly. But let's look at the impact. What look, let's, let's look at uh, how much we need, we need to do, uh, you know, how uh, so-called, uh, what is the size of this LIBO exposure to us. Can we go to the next slide, please? EG has not just now have shared with us the latest position uh, one year later from June 2019, but these are the number that we have seen, uh, what Ben and Gala have shared with us in the 2019 financial stability report. So at that point of time, one year ago, uh, the exposure to LIBOR was uh, 857 billion. So I think you have heard us not sharing that now. One year later, in June 2020, we, we have reached about 1.1 trillion. So we know we are growing even during the uh, COVID-19 situation. And you look at the breakdown, uh, last part of that is derivative, where you know these are either swaps or cross-currency sort of option, 79%. But as you know, uh, as you're aware just now, AG has not shared that the latest position uh, is about 76%. So we are about there, 75 to 80%. If you break down uh, the exposure, uh, it's about 80%. Then we have, of course, uh, exposure into the on-balance sheet asset, so-called. 13% is loans and financing, where, of course, we have to do more work, uh, as all of you are very well aware. Loans, uh, the contracts, the financing contract, right, is... is that there are work to be done if you need to replace the LIBO or the rate for charging interest or profit, right? So that's 13%, but not too bad. Uh, just that 
uh, we have concern of course uh, after 2021 without LIBO, so negotiation should start. Then the rest of the asset about uh, the rest of the exposure about 8%, uh, bonds and interbank lending and borrowing, not too bad, right? And uh, much of the 8% is because of interbank lending and borrowing where it's not difficult to handle the impact. So as you can see in the total exposure, about 80% is derivative where you know, we will have the benefit of the ISTAR fallback. So a lot of hard work of course is on the loans and financing. And just to give us perspective, as said, 30th June to July last year, the size of the total banking asset was about 2.8 trillion. So if you compare 857 billion to 2.8 trillion, so it's about 30%. But uh, this 857 billion, about 80% is so-called off-balance sheet when we talk from accounting term, right? These are not on-balance sheet assets. So within, within 2.8 trillion, uh, asset June 2019, derivative position was also included. But if you compare, so it's about 30%, not too bad, but still a lot of work to do. But if you look at on balance sheet, particularly loan, 13% out of this uh, 5.7 billion, we compare uh, total loans and financing in the banking system uh, as at June 2019 was about 1.7 trillion. So it's about 6.5%. So I would say that um, not too bad, uh, while we have work to do, uh, so it's about 6 to 7% exposure. It's an on balance sheet, mainly loans, where we have a lot of work to do. Of course, as uh, A.G. Asnan shared, you know, uh, among the banks here, uh, there are different progresses we have noted. The messages have been passed, right, uh, since uh, earlier 2019. All the banks have set up their own internal com internal committee, uh, internal working group. Uh, but we, know, we observe that all of them have different progresses, right? Uh, the approach taken uh, to do the transition or the reform also is different, depending on their exposure to, to LIBOR. Of course, there are also exposure to other form of IBO, right? CYBO, for example, or URIBO. But uh, the main exposure, as I understand, is USD LIBO. So because of that, uh, different banks have different progresses and the risks that they see, they will face and have to be handled also are seen differently. The risks we can, I can share with you uh, in the next slide where, you know, these are the, are the, these are the impact we have to handle where, you know, uh, the bank already have, looking at, have been looking at what are the risks that uh, can arise uh, when handling this transition. So that's, that's a, snap, a snapshot of the impact to us. So not too bad, uh, about 1.1 1. 1 trillion now already. Uh, now I think our uh, total banking asset also already exceeded 3 trillion. So it's about 30% uh, if you look at one balance sheet. Can we go to the next slide, please? These are the area we have to handle. So um, these are the impact uh, we have to face with and we have to have uh, initiative to handle. Of course, as an accountant, I will start with accounting and financial reporting impact. So that's very important, right? When we uh, transition from IBO, right, to uh, alternative risk-free rate, what are the impact? Whether there's any impact to profit and loss, whether we will see changes in the balance sheet. Uh, very happy to, to, to report back to you and later my colleague Damien will, will explain more is that uh, IASP, International Accounting Center Board, as well as the Malaysian Accounting Center Board, MSP, you know, we have been very facilitative. Uh, this accounting center body have been uh, looking at the impact that all of us will face when we transition to uh, automatic registry rate. So because of the amendments in two phases into accounting standard, we do not foresee much uh, impact into the PNL, uh, particularly. Uh, of course, as you are aware, uh, there can be some impact, but if really uh, if we have to revise a contract, for example, or we have to have a new replacing swap or derivative purely due to transition into a new reference rate, you won't see a PNL impact. Uh, so if you are doing hedging, hedge accounting, you know, many of us are applying. Uh, most of this hedge accounting can continue because of the amendment to the current center. And uh, as the intention to uh, now uh, to take reference into a new rate is not to transfer economic value. So we do not see uh, economic gain or loss recorded in PNL as well. Of course, uh, I have to caution you, uh, where Damien will also talk to you more later. If at the same time when the contracts are being re revised, uh, both counterparty take the opportunity to also revise other terms, right? Uh, let's say there are other changes, not solely due to IBO. Uh, reform, then they will, that can be accounting impact. Otherwise, it's, it's quite safe to say that uh, I do not expect, we do not expect uh, material accounting impact, but 
uh, as uh, Adrian just now mentioned about tax. So we have to think about the impact to tax. Uh, the primary view in Malaysia is that, as you're aware, that's this for banks. For banks, uh, the way we compute tax payable is largely following financial reporting. It means as long as we apply MFRS in determining the profit before tax, taxable income. So largely, IRB will just follow and look at the uh, MFRS. So if we do not have P&L impact, so it's safe to say that there shouldn't be material impact to tax. But of course, we have to uh, confirm that. And as I understand that uh, most of the bank are still working on that, uh, including via the association. For corporates, I think they are probably more impact because uh, for corporates, it depends on which industry you are in. RRB has taken different approach, whether we uh, fully follow the MFRS or the adjustment required. So that's on the first area, a lot of work to be done. And as you are aware, of course, due to the change in the contract, you know, there are contracts uh, amendments required. Uh, we, we had to talk to the lawyer, we had to discuss with the lawyer. And very importantly, as you know, uh, Malaysia has a developed Islamic financial market. You know, as, as you're aware that uh, we already have 30%, more than 30% uh, where the banking asset you know, is under Islamic uh, concept. So we know at this point of time, there are some Sharia compliance issues being handled. Uh, not too bad, but we have to keep focused. There are two that I was told by the Sharia expert. One is about uncertainty. As you're aware, going forward under the RFR, um, we need to compound right, the overnight rate. Overnight rate is a daily rate. We need to compound to get a term rate, to get a one month, three month, six month, 12 month rate. So the compounding itself, whether it will give rise to Shara impact, uh, we have to study, you know, we have to confirm. As you're aware, under Shara principle, um, uh, non -compound, we, we do not compound profit, right? There's no compounding of interest so-called in, in the Shara world. Uh, the other impact is about uncertainty, as, as you're aware at this point of time. If you have a R&R, uh, &R, or the reference uh, free rate, uh, we have to compile the reference free rate in errors, right? We have to use actual overnight rate, then we, we compile it to get the actual rate at the end of the period. So it's uncertainty involved. So you do not know how much uh, interest or profit to pay uh, uh, until the end of, uh, let's say, a quarterly uh, a repricing period. So that's uh, uncertainty involved. So, you know, we have to confirm whether there's any uh, Shara requirement, uh, Shara compliance issue. With that. That's on the second area. So a lot of work needs to need to be done, including working with the Shara expert, Shara scholar. Of course, I think as uh, the AG mentioned as well, we need to negotiate uh, with the customer, the bank need to negotiate the customer and the corporate, of course, you, you probably are talking to the bank as well. So there'll be negotiation involved. And the risk risk rate is without credit spread compared to LIBO, right? If you have a, a contract a derivative or a loan based on LIBO that was with credit spread imputed, but risk free rate, overnight rate, for example, or software or whatever rate we use is without credit spread. So there'll be negotiation involved. Of course, um, reputation uh, of the bank can be affected if this process is not done uh, so-called transparently. Um, and uh, we, we do as banks re have responsibility towards the customer. So that's a big area. Customer uh, you know, engagement and at the least we have to make the customer understand. The banker, we have to talk a lot with, with your customer. And lastly, of course, as you're aware, uh, when we change the way uh, we derive uh, discount rate, so valuation will change, right? Uh, the modeling uh, we have to be revised. We now change from LIBOR uh, from interbank offer rate into registry rate, right? And uh, the model need to be changed, the model need to be revised, and valuation will be affected. Uh, when we determine fair value, for example, right, we need to have discount rate. Time value is important. I think there is some uh, technical issue. Uh... Hi, can you so hear let's... me? Hi, hi. Okay. Um, you just drop off. So I think you have to start from um... the last part modeling. Yes, yes. Yes, the screen is not up yet, but let me just continue. The interbank offer rate with the risk free rate. So that will affect valuation. And only that. Uh, as you are aware, and the, under the IFRS, MFRS, MFRS, we measure impairment for loans, when you measure impairment for bonds. 
So discovery is important, time value is important. As well for insurance industry, right? When we determine uh, the insurance liability, so discovery is important and it's part of the component. So because of the revision to models, because of the revision to value methodology, processes need to be revised, right? A lot of work needs to be done as well into the system. So all these are, we are talking about volumes and the system needs to be updated uh, with all these changes. Of course, when changes are involved, we need to make sure guns is in place. Uh, who will be reviewing, who will do validation, and then approval at the end to put into the process and system. So that's a nutshell of the impact we see, right, when we are now going through the reform. Uh, if we can go to the last slide, I'm not sure whether you can see the slide, I can't see on the screen. The, sli the last slide is on the screen. AG Asnan has shared uh, with a quote, right? I yes, that's right. That's right. <laughs> There's a quote I copy from. Uh, yeah, can you see the screen now? Because we can see your camera finally now. Can you see oh, the screen? I cannot see the screen. I'm not sure okay. about it. Do you want me to read the quote or you have it on? That's okay. Let me read the quote. So okay, there's sure. a quote from a senior executive of a bank. What he said is that we do not foresee the issues other than probably on certain loan renegotiation and the tedious operational process going through. So, so I think what, what uh, uh, this banker has shared with us is that uh, with exposure I'm sorry about uh, uh, Hoi Lam dropping off. Uh, there might be some connection issues on his side. Um, so maybe uh, Rebecca, do you want to take it from here? If Hoi Lam comes back late, okay. I think he's back now. Just a moment. Hoi Lam? Hi, sorry, sorry. Okay. I think there is some, some, something wrong about your uh, connection. But okay. you're back now, so let's carry on. Thank you. Tedious process going ahead, and uh, I wish everybody good luck in going through this uh, challenging process. Thank you, Rebecca. Back to you. Thank you, Holam. We really appreciated your thoughts and obviously we're going to try and help everyone do the heavy lifting to work through the TDL operational processes together. Um, next, we're going to turn it over to Jing Gu, who's head of A legal Asia Pacific for ISDA, and she's going to walk us through um, the ISDA issues with a particular emphasis on how it relates to derivatives that are originated in Mar Malaysia. Over to you, Jing. Thank you. Okay, um, sorry, struggling a bit, little bit uh, technical issues. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to speak uh, on this event. Um, I, it's, uh, it's good to hear um, the governor's comment that um, market participants are not overly concerned about um, the fallback issue as far as direct to transaction as, uh, are concerned because it has been working on a solution. Um, yes, we are. Um, the documents have been finalized and we're just awaiting for the business review letter from the U.S. Department of Justice. And once uh, that letter is issued, it still will give market participants two to four weeks notice about the launch of the ISTA protocol and also ISTA supplement. So for the next 15 minutes, I will go through very quickly 
the, um, the, the main provisions of the ISTA supplement and ISTA protocol and what it means to your LIBOR and IBOR contracts. Um, the, the document is actually fairly complicated. The supplement is over 100 pages. Um, typically, I often spend a, over an hour to go through those documents. Today we have only 15 minutes, so, but please do free to ask questions if there is anything which is unclear to you. Next slide. Okay, um, so as you are aware of in the, in the major uh, financial centers, um, the, the National Working Group have identified the risk-free rates um, the LIBOR uh, contracts uh, should transition to and also the fallback for some of the uh, local IBORs. Um, so why are changes to fallback necessary? Um, typically most of the interest rate directo transactions are using the 2006 uh, definitions published by ISTA. Um, under the current definitions, um, the fallbacks um, typically require the account party that is a calculation agent to obtain quotations from major dealers in the relevant inter-dealer market if the, uh, the IBOR is not available. Um, so those uh, IBOR are defined as floating rate options in section 7.1 of the 2006 is the definitions. Each currency has slightly different waterfall, but generally speaking, the last waterfall is always the dealer's pole. So as you, as you can imagine, if LIBOR ceases to be published permanently, it's, um, it's impractical for the parties to go out to the, uh, to the inter-dealer market to get a quotation for the rest of the trades. And also when LIBOR is not available, um, it's very possible the calculation, agent, the calculation agent will not be able to obtain any quotations from, from dealers. Um, so when those provisions were drafted, they were really considering the scenario where the rate was just a temporarily unavailable. It was not really um, designed for the scenario where LIBOR will cease publication permanently. And for that reason is to together with FSB or SSG um, to work on um, adding robust fallbacks to the 2006 ISTA definition booklet. Next slide. So the ISTA fallback document will cover 13 floating rate options. So on this slide, you th this uh, include 11 uh, floating rate options. The fallbacks of the 11 floating rate options will be published by Bloomberg Index Services Limited, which has been chosen as uh, uh, official adjustment services window uh, by ISTA. So they will publish the fallback rate for the um, LIBOR currency and plus a few IBORs, including BBSW in Australia, HIBOR in Hong Kong, CDOR in uh, Canada, um, uh, EuroLIBOR, and also, um, uh, and also EuroBOR. Um, for two floating rate options, the fallback will be published by ABS and uh, Bank of Thailand. The reason is because um, SOAR used in Singapore and, and the Thai baht fix used in Thailand, they are a FX swap implied rates. So they have two components. One is uh, um, a local currency US dollar swap and one is US dollar LIBOR. Um, so for um, those two currencies, the current administrator taking SOAR as example, ABS will use the dollar LIBOR fallback, which is SOFA plus the spread adjustment published by Bloomberg and use that number and then plug in the um, FX swap points to calculate the fallback rate for SOAR. Okay, next slide. Um, so just to have a quick word about this four um, FX swap implied rate used in Asia. So in addition to SOAR and Thai baht fix, we also have my four and uh, the Philippines uh, uh, interbank reference rate. Um, 
Thai, both Thailand and Singapore have made a decision regarding what would happen to the trades, referencing the local um, local uh, eyeball. Um, as you may be aware of, in Singapore, they've decided to move to essentially phase out SOAR and also uh, CYBOR and then move everything, both cash instrument and, and the direct to transactions into this um, IFR rate, which is called SORA. Um, for legacy trades, as I mentioned, if your existing contracts still have reference to SOAR, and that would be fallback on this call SOAR fallback, or sometimes people refer it as adjusted SOAR, which essentially will continue to have a link to US dollar LIBOR, but when dollar LIBOR goes away, then you just use SOFA to calculate. As I mentioned, ABS will publish the fallback rate. So very similar approach has been taken in Thailand, um, where the new trades will be moved to a new IFR, uh, Bank of Thailand start to publish uh, April this year, uh, which is called Thai Overnight Repo Rate. But for the legacy um, Thai Bat fixed trades, those trades will be uh, fall back on a reversed, uh, revised version of the Thai Bat fix, similar to uh, what SOAR will be using. Um, Indian and uh, the Philippines haven't made a decision. So once they uh, make the decision about what should be their fallback for the legacy trades, East will offer a documentation solution. Next slide. Okay, now let, I will spend uh, next five minutes just to go through what is included in the fallback supplement protocol. Um, so there are two major documents. One, one is called supplement, which is an amendment to the 2006 is the definition. So the amendment is amending section 7.1, the definitions on floating rate options. Um, so the, um, the amendments will generally include the existing price source information and then a statement identifying the objective trigger for permanent cessation or pre-cessation that would activate the selected fallbacks and also a description of the fallback that would apply upon the occurrence of the trigger, which would be the adjusted RFR plus spread adjustment. Um, so upon the effective date of the supplement amending the relevant floating rate option, all new derivative transactions that incorporate the 2006 definition will include the fallback. Uh, in other words, the parties do not need to take any additional actions. But however, uh, you will still need to uh, find a solution to your legacy trades, which will enter into prior to the effective date of the ISTA supplement, fallback supplement. So this will be um, achieved by adhering to the ISTA protocol. Um, so the protocol is a multilateral amendment agreement. Um, so by adhering to the protocol, the market participants would agree their legacy trades with other adherents will include the amended floating rate options for the relevant eyeball and will therefore include the fallback. Um, as always, any protocol will be completely voluntary and it will only amend contracts between two parties which have signed up to the ISTA protocol. Okay, so if your company hasn't adhered to the ISTA protocol, the amendments wouldn't be effective, uh, you know, as far as your transactions with that company are concerned. Um, by adhering to the protocol, so essentially your uh, new trades and your legacy portfolios would be aligned. So they will include uh, both uh, trade, both portfolios will include the, the amended floating rate options with the fallbacks. Um, so in terms of the coverage of the protocol, the protocol will cover uh, is the master agreement, is the credit support document and, and uh, confirmations which um, uh, is subject to the is the master agreements. Um, so as long as your um, documents incorporate one of the uh, several is the interest rate definition booklet, those include the 2006, 2000, uh, 2000 and 1991 version. Um, and also if your uh, contracts include a reference uh, of, of an eyeball as defined in or has a meaning one of the several is the definition booklets I've just mentioned or it reference an eyeball however it is defined those will all be covered under the ISTA protocol. 
In addition, ISTA protocol will also be extended to certain non-ISTA master agreements and credit support documents and confirmations which supplement uh, and is subject to that non-ISTA master agreement. Um, so ISTA has circulated a list of the non-ISTA documents covered under the protocol to, um, to our working group members. And uh, the list is included as part of the protocol. So people would be able to say clearly what agreements are covered. Um, so those typically cover a lot of the uh, master agreements used in specific, the local markets. It also includes some of the, um, the, the industry standard documents for other types of products, for example, uh, the repo agreement, GIMRA, and also the security, securities lending agreement, um, GIMSLA, um, they are also included in the ISTA IBOR fallback protocol. Next slide. Um, just one thing to mention, um, ISTA protocol does not cover any centrally cleared directed trades. It's only applied to non-centrally cleared directed trades. However, the clearing houses have all indicated they, they will use the powers in their rule book to implement the fallbacks uh, in all of their legacy cleared directives transaction as of the effective date of the updates. And for the new trades, because most of the CCP's rules incorporate its 2006 definitions, so the new trades will also include the fallback, as I mentioned, similar to the OTC uh, trades. Um, next slide. Yeah, the fallback will be tri triggered upon a permanent discontinuation of the relevant IBOR um, subject to, um, to uh, term and spread adjustment. Um, so the permanent discontinuation trigger is defined as index cessation event in the um, non-LIBOR rate options. So those would include, as I mentioned, CEDOR in Canada and BBSW in Australia and HIBOR in Hong Kong. Um, for a LIBOR rate options, those are the five LIBOR currencies plus uh, Singapore uh, S SOR, the, uh, the, the Singapore swap rate, and Thai baht fix. For those uh, floating rate options, um, they will be, the fallbacks will be triggered upon the early of the, the, the two following events. One is permanent discontinuation, and second is a non-representativeness of, of the LIBOR in the relevant currency. So what it means is really, um, if FCA makes an announcement to say LIBOR is no longer representative of the economic reality, and that will also trigger your, um, your contract fallbacks. So that's only applicable to the LIBOR rate options. Okay, next slide. Um, so RFRs are, are, are quite different from um, IBORs because uh, IBORs are available in multiple tenors where RFRs are over, overnight rates. So IBOR also incorporate a bank credit risk premium and other factors. Therefore, adjustments are needed to the RFRs to ensure contracts originally negotiated to reference the IBOR continue to meet original objectives of, of the companies to the extent possible once the fallback takes effect. Um, so it has done uh, a few uh, market consultations and the methodology chosen by market participants uh, is based on compounded setting areas and also the five-year historic media approach um, to the spread adjustment. So regarding the tenor, uh, compounded setting areas means um, you will be looking at RFRs observed over a period and compounded that rate daily. Um, so the rate is adjusted whereby the, the uh, observation period is backward shifted to allow for the rate to be known prior to the relevant payment dates. Um, this is necessary because we're moving from forward-looking IBOR rate to a backward-looking RFR rate. Um, Regarding the credit adjustment, it will be the five-year historic media approach, um, which means you'll be looking at the media spot spread between the IBOR and the term adjusted IFR calculated over a static look, at, look back period of five years prior to the index cessation event. 
Um, and that spread adjustment will be added to the compounded setting or reuse rate, um, but will not be compounded itself. Okay, next slide. So where, where should you look for those uh, fallback adjustments? So Bloomberg uh, started to publish those um, fallback adjustments for the 11 floating rate options I've mentioned in uh, mid-July. So they published three numbers. One is uh, um, the adjusted IFRs, which is a compounded setting arrears for each IFR for the each relevant eyeball tenor. The second is a spread adjustment um, calculated based on the five years um, media approach, as, as I've just mentioned. And then the all-in fallback rate, uh, which combines adjusted IFR and the spread adjustment for each relevant eyeball tenor. Um, the publication is on an indicative basis now because the index cessation event hasn't occurred. So once the index cessation event occurred, which triggers a fallback, um, the spread adjustment will be fixed on that day. But however, the spread adjustment will not be applicable until the relevant uh, eyeball says to be published. So there is a different uh, definition called index cessation effective date. So giving example, uh, let's say if um, FCA or IBA make announcement to say LIBOR will cease to be published from Jan 2020, and today would be the index cessation event day, which fix your spread, but the uh, fallback rate will not apply until the Jan 2020 when LIBOR actually goes away. You will have to look at alternative uh, price source to calculate the contract payout, okay? Um, next slide. Okay, so this is a timeline. Um, as I mentioned in the very beginning, we're waiting for um, the uh, business review letter from the US Department of Justice. And also, we also need to, um, to, to uh, run the issue with a few uh, competition law authorities in other jurisdictions where um, once that's completed, uh, is to will give market participants two to four weeks notice of the launch date. The effective date will be set um, and the date, which is two to four months after the publication. Um, so, so um, you know, obviously we will um, look at the holiday calendar and try to avoid that effective date falling um, within a holiday period. Okay, next slide. Um, one thing to mention, uh, I do want to have a very quick word about uh, the ISTA fallback protocol. The protocol, similar to other ISTA protocol, is open to ISTA members and non-members. So typically, ISTA protocol are open for adherence once it's launched or you know published on the ISTA website. But for this one, we're having introducing additional procedures called adherence in escrow which means we will start to allow market participants to adhere to the protocol during this two to four weeks notice before the um, official launch, launch date happens. So this is the intended to for, um, for, the, um, for the, uh, the, the market participants which have uh, large exposure uh, to LIBOR and also the IBOR covered under the ISTA under the ISTA protocol. Um, so this will be done through a private link. Uh, ISTA sent to uh, parties who will be interested in the adherence in escrow procedures. Um, so we, why take up of this procedure will result in a broad and a comprehensive list of adherence published on the ISTA website once the IBOR fallback protocol is launched, thereby indicate to the market and expectation wide usage of the new fallbacks. So ISTA has written to all the national working groups encouraging their working group members to, um, uh, in, uh, to utilize this uh, uh, adherence in escrow procedure to the extent possible. So we've received a very positive feedback from most of the national working groups on this point. Next slide. <clears throat> 
There will be other templates available to facilitate uh, the, the LIBOR transition. ISTA will publish a short form bilateral amendment agreement and also a long form bilateral amendment agreement. So therefore parties can incorporate the provisions of the ISTA protocol bilaterally. Uh, there will be also, also be wording which allow for um, parties to exclude certain transactions from your uh, from your uh, the the IBOR protocol and also uh, disapply the precession triggers if parties uh, desire to do so. Okay, next slide. Um, there are uh, a one big event coming, which is the uh, CCP discounting and PAI switch. Um, so for Euro, this was completed in July 2020. And for so far, uh, the CCP, CCP, which clear US denominated uh, interest rate products, will um, uh, complete the switch uh, on October 16. So this will move the discounting rate from Fed fund to SOFA. Next slide. Uh, ISTA will also publish the collateral amendment interest rate definitions and also templates to facilitate um, market participants to also switch the discounting rate in their bilateral CSAs. Uh, because once the CCP central clear trades, uh, PAI and discounting switch happen, uh, market participants might want to amend their bilateral CSA to lie uh, the discounting with the centrally clear trades. So therefore, East has published two templates to facilitate the amendment. Next slide. Um, one thing I do want to mention is that uh, the ISTA documents are really your safety night. So if you have uh, LIBOR contracts or some of the IBOR contracts outstanding, and then by incorporate the ISTA, uh, the uh, IBOR protocol um, provisions, um, and, and you will have uh, a safety night, you know, if LIBOR is to be published, uh, there would be a, a fallback rate uh, applies. But however, the fallback uh, mechanism is not meant to be your main measure to, man to manage LIBOR transitions. I think this is a very important message. Market participants should be, um, you know, review your portfolios, looking at what exposure for your cash products, what are your, your exposure for your directors products, and then see whether it's possible to close out your current LIBOR transition and move to the RFR or other rates to the extent possible, right? And do not wait for just rely on the fallback to be, to be your, um, your main transaction uh, transition mechanism. So voluntary transition is also very important. Next slide. Um, there is a, a fair amount of information on ISTA website regarding the LIBOR transition and the IBOR fallback issue. We published a few uh, fact sheets um, and please do take a look. Um, and if you have any questions, please feel free to um, always send me a question. Thank you. Thank you, Jing. That, that was really helpful. I think our um audience has a better understanding of how to approach uh, IBOR transition with respect to derivative products. Now I'm going to turn it over to Mushtaq Kapasi from ICMA who can give us a similar perspective as it relates to bonds. Thank you very much, Rebecca. And thank you also to the organizers of the event, um, FMA, uh, for inviting me to speak here. So I represent ICMA, International Capital Market Association, which generally covers the bond markets. And I have to say I am um, a little bit relieved uh, to hear the remarks of the uh, governor and of Ian Y. Um, it seems that the LIBOR linked uh, bond uh, exposure in Malaysia is um, certainly lower compared to that of derivatives and loans and other instruments, and I hope manageable. However, even if it's just 1% of the total exposure that according to my calculations is about eight to 10 uh, billion ringgit, um, which could be significant. And I think it's important to just highlight, at least at a very high level, very quickly, some of the issues related to the bond market, because at least in my view, um, the bond uh, transition from LIBOR is actually a little bit more tricky 
in a few ways than um, derivatives and even of loans. So I'll just spend a, just a couple of minutes talking about the high level issues to leave more time uh, for you to di digest um, the information given by others um, on the derivatives and loan markets. So first of all, um, I just want to reiterate the words of the governor that the market should prepare for a cessation of LIBOR at the end of 2021. And regulatory authorities around the world, I'm glad to hear Bank Nagara being one of these, have been clear that this target date will not be postponed um, during the, uh, due to the pandemic. And the regulatory authorities worldwide have consistently stated that the best way to minimize LIBOR transition risks is simply not to issue new bonds and new other instruments linked to LIBOR and to actively transition any instruments that already link to LIBOR um, that will mature after the end of 2021. Of course, those that mature before 2021 are not as problematic. Now, in the global US dollar FRN market, we've seen significant new issuance directly linked to, so far, the risk-free rate, uh, more than 650 billion US dollars. This is great, but in Asia and around the rest of the world, we're still seeing in parallel significant new issuance directly linked to LIBOR. There are many reasons for this, obviously, inertia, um, not lack of familiarity, lack of um, lack of clarity about the new fallbacks, but ICMA certainly strongly recommends um, that new issuance and uh, floating rates goes to SOFR as soon as possible, including in Asia. Next slide, please. So if the issuance of LIBOR-linked bonds is unavoidable, and I understand in many cases it might be, then it's strongly recommended to use robust fallbacks to risk-free rates. For the US LIBOR market, of course, this is SOFR, and last year the ARRC, or the Alternative Reference Rates Committee, uh, based in the US, produced fallback language for new US dollar LIBOR FRN contracts. Note this is applicable only to new US dollar denominated FRNs. But the US authorities, and we share this view, have also said that as good as the fallback language may be, simply relying on fallback language to transition still gives rise to a number of operational risks and economic risks. So just having the fallbacks in there is not necessarily the best practice. Market participants should be moving to referencing alternative rates such as SOFR directly. Just briefly to mention the UK market, um, we have seen success story in the, U, uh, the GBP, or sorry, the uh, uh, pound link, the sterling link LIBOR market where um, LIBOR-linked notes have all but ceased. So the reason I mention this is that it is actually possible to transition the market directly to the risk-free rates um, without use, relying on uh, the various LIBOR uh, fallbacks. I should emphasize, of course, that any new fallback language, again, will apply just to new issuances and not to um, existing issuances. Next slide, please. So, if we take the pool of outstanding LIBOR-linked bonds, including those in Malaysia, it's helpful, for me at least, to divide this into three categories. The first category is those maturing before the end of 2021. Fortunately, these short-dated bonds, we don't have to worry about. They'll go ahead and mature, and um, LIBOR will continue to exist for the life of those bonds. The second category is new LIBOR-linked bonds issued from after around uh, 2017, when the market became aware that LIBOR would end. So, the good news here is that the market is generally aware that LIBOR is not going to be around much longer. And these include uh, fallbacks of some sort, maybe not the best fallbacks, but fallbacks of some sort to another risk-free rate once LIBOR has gone. The third category is the most tricky. And these are the ones that we're the most worried about. We generally call them tough legacy, although that term tough legacy can be a bit vague. But what I'm talking about here are bonds referencing LIBOR that mature beyond 2021, and that were issued earlier um, than the time at which we knew LIBOR would end. So these are extremely problematic because if they go to, if, if LIBOR ceases to exist, there's actually no fallback. And then what happens? Well, basically what happens under these bonds is that LIBOR, sorry, the legacy bonds will fall back to a fixed rate. If you look at what the fallbacks are in these sort of old legacy bonds, Basically, the fallbacks just account for the possibility that LIBOR might not exist for a day or two due to some um, unforeseen event, and then LIBOR will come back. So the fallback is basically just to go to the last rate referenced by LIBOR. If this happens at the end of 2021, 
the floating rate bond will effectively convert to a fixed rate bond. This clearly gives rise to potential commercial and even, legacy, even litigation risks, since obviously the fixed rate would not reflect the commercial intention of the parties when they entered into the transaction. Next slide, please. So what are the options for legacy bonds? I'll go through these extremely quickly. So first of all, if there are bonds that are governed by UK law, generally you can try what's called a consent solicitation process, which is basically a way for all bondholders to agree to amend the bonds. It's a somewhat difficult, often costly process, but it has worked in more than about two dozen cases already um, in the sterling market. So we know it can work, but it won't necessarily be uh, feasible for the entire market. For the US um, law governed bonds, the New York law governed bonds, it's even more difficult because there is no real consent solicitation process in practice. And even worse, many, if not all of the bonds require 100% of bondholders to um, approve of any amendments to the bonds. So you can see that in this case with legacy bonds governed by New York law, it's even more difficult than the loan markets where you have bilateral or syndicated loans, where you have a smaller group of people that need to agree to the changes in um, the contractual law. With bonds, it can be extremely difficult, if not impossible. So I really wanna highlight that, even though this pool of bonds that may be affected may be small, the difficulties in amending those bonds may be extremely difficult. And it's important to consider that extremely early and to consider the options. Now, fortunately, um, next slide, please. We have seen some uh, proposals from the various regulatory authorities um, to um, find ways to address this. Now, the bad news is that these uh, potential solutions are all a little bit different um, in the way they operate. The good news is that we're hopeful that they'll lead to the same economic result, which is the bonds being linked to the um, appropriate uh, fallback, which is most likely for you, uh, so for under US dollar LIBOR, but it could be something different for the other currency LIBORs. Now, in um, the UK, um, they are thinking about basically creating a synthetic LIBOR. And what this means, I know synthetic LIBOR is a little bit funny of a word, but what this basically means is that LIBOR will continue to exist, but it'll be defined differently to be based on the, um, uh, on the, on the risk-free rate. So basically, um, the con contracts will not change, but the actual calculation of LIBOR, uh, LIBOR will change into something, a different animal, so to speak. That's the, basically the UK proposal. The US proposal, um, and again, these are all in very early stages. The US proposal is basically to provide an automatic change in the contract so that LIBOR-linked contracts will go to SOFR-linked contracts and contain the applicable fallbacks. Of course, there are opt-out provisions and there are some other details here and how that actually works. I won't go into that, but basically it's a way under uh, New York law for the contracts to shift automatically without too much trouble from the market participants. And now, uh, next slide, please. Uh, sorry, one more slide and one more slide. Just one more, please. Sorry, I skipped through these. If, if, you, if you're actually interested in the details of these proposals, uh, please do contact me uh, directly or you can address in the Q&A and I'm happy to go into more detail about that. Um, the final legislative proposal that has been uh, tabled most recently is with the EU. And the EU is basically going to, uh, well, under its proposal, propose that um, LIBOR link contracts be automatically replaced by a new uh, fallback or new fallbacks, depending on the currency, to be mandated by the EU. So all of these operate slightly differently. Um, and again, it's early stages. We don't know what the final uh, legal uh, or regulatory reforms are going to be. It differs based on the um, choice of law under your contract. So um, I don't wanna make this overcomplicated, but it's just important to start looking at this right now. If you might have any bonds that are maturing after 2021 linked to any kind of LIBOR. Next slide, please. Now the final option for legacy bonds is to buy back the bonds by way of a tender offer or open market repurchase or issue new bonds in exchange for the legacy bonds by way of an exchange offer. 
This is also not an easy process, but it is a feasible one. And of course, the final option, which is not ideal, is just to let the bonds operate according to their terms, which means that they will revert to a fixed rate, even though this was never the issuer's or the investor's intention. In closing, I'd like to mention, um, and I think a um, gentleman from EY already alluded to these, that there are other risks related to the transition from LIBOR in the bond markets, just as in the other asset classes, risks of hedging mismatches, recharacterization risks of capital instruments. I think this one is underappreciated. Tax events and un unfavorable accounting implications. And I think some of our speakers will speak about these um, in, uh, later on in this webinar. And also potential mis-selling or conduct risk. What if you marketed a floating rate bond and it becomes fixed rate? This could be a potential problem as well. We at ICMA would be very happy to provide more general guidance on these. Although please note, we cannot give legal advice on your particular circumstances. And finally, I'd like to mention that ICMA has a comprehensive uh, risk-free rate webpage on the ICMA website with hyperlinks to a wealth of materials related to the bond markets. These are official publications, speeches, technical papers, um, and um, other fallback language. So with that, I'll close my section of the webinar and thank you again for your attention. Thank you, Mushtaq, that was fabulous. Um, let's turn it over to Andrew Hutchinson at um, Clifford Chance to help us understand a little bit more about what's going on in the loan market in Malaysia. Thank you. Hi there. Um, hopefully you can hear me. Um, I don't seem to have appeared on the side bubble, um, but I will. I can see the slides, so I'll um, I'll carry on. Um, thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Um, and I think one of the things that Jing said about her presentation was some of the slides were an hour presentation on their own. Um, and I think some of the things I'm going to talk about um, in this 15 minutes again when I get to the documentation points, um, that's an hour presentation all on its own. So um, it is quite high level. Um, we'll race you through some of the points um, very quickly. Um, so if there are any questions, obviously I'm happy to answer them and happy to get in touch um, and, and answer any questions afterwards as well. So um, <clears throat> some of the things on my slides we've already touched on um, and I'll just mention them, but what I'll do is try and put them in context of what we have been seeing um, in the loan market um, and in documentation um, for loans. So I'm going to give a quick overview and some thoughts on um, what we've seen with lenders and borrowers um, becoming more prepared to deal with the issues. I'm going to talk probably for the longest time on loan documentation and the issues and how that's been developing. Um, and then there's some slides at the back where I'm going to talk about not really documentation, but what we've seen um, lenders doing um, internally to get ready um, for transition to risk-free rates. Um, and there were a few comments about loans being the difficult one, um, and I think that's right. There's a lot more negotiation and a lot more issues to come to conclusions on um, on loans, but i um, very glad to hear uh, Mushtaq saying that the bonds are even worse because um, loans, um, when we're going through this transition, um, get a slightly bad reputation for being difficult. Um, so here, I mean, this touches on some of the comments that have been previously made. Um, on the left-hand side, there's just a quote there, and the main point of that is, you know, LIBOR will end rather than if it will end. So that theme that we've heard so far of needing to be ready and needing to deal with the issues is, is a very important one. Um, now, there's a lot of loan exposure in Asia to US dollars um, and LIBOR, so we're being driven a bit um, by what the US, what the UK and Europe are doing on that. Um, and there's been a sense um, that uh, Asia is uh, following um, what they are doing. Um, and this sort of wait and see idea, which I think from my personal perspective sort of makes sense because of that linkage with uh, US dollar and LIBOR. Um, but definitely over the last three to six months, we've seen a lot more activity around documentation. We've seen transactions being done. We've seen banks being prepared for this transition. So whilst loans were sort of 
behind the derivative space um, in dealing with the issues around the move to risk-free rates. Um, we're catching up now um, and there's a lot more going on. It, it's not, not quite an all-time, uh, an all-day job every day, but um, it's certainly becoming um, an area where there's a lot of development, uh, which is good to see. So just quickly on the right hand side, um, I think that the points here have already been covered, but one I'd just like to focus on low awareness of live or discontinuation and acceptance of risk free rates. And I think the key thing to think about here is engagement between lenders and borrowers. Um, we've done a lot of um, webinars um, for clients, uh, financial institution clients for their borrowers. Uh, um, and there is um, probably a large number of borrowers out there that um, are less aware of the issues than maybe um, the lending community is. So I think that's very important. Um, one of the things that that, that has driven is um, around documentation, um, things like mandate letters and term sheets. If you are doing a loan transaction that is going past the cessation of LIBOR or whatever interbank rate it is, um, then you should be putting disclaimers on those documents. So the borrower is aware that the transaction that he is entering into will have an issue if that reference rate is disappearing during the life of the deal. Now, that goes one of two ways. The borrower says, yes, I'm aware of that. Thank you very much. Um, or the borrower says, what does this mean? Um, and then you can deal with the issue now rather than in six or nine months time when perhaps as a lender, you might find out that your borrower is slightly annoyed that you're now coming back to him to say, you need to renegotiate the loan documentation. So that's a practical difference that we're seeing a lot more people adopt that on their documentation. Um, I've talked about US dollar and LIBOR, but remember, uh, as Jing said, you know, uh, the FX rate in sort of Singapore, tie so it's relevant to other currencies as well and i'd also say you know if you've got a jurisdiction where your interbank rate is what you're using um just moving to a risk-free rate the things i'm going to talk about on documentation are still relevant even if it's not us dollar and you're not liable uh, because they're really issues around moving to a completely different way of calculating um, how your loan works um, can we go to the next slide please Um, so very quickly on the next two slides, because uh, these have been touched on, but we always put these on because um, when we're talking in the loan space, um, that idea that someone's going to come and save us, loans are all too difficult, we've got to renegotiate everything, it's far too painful. Um, so do not assume that move to risk-free rates, discontinuation of LIBOR will be solved by the regulators. Um, it won't. Um, do not think that industry groups will solve everything for you. Um, so in the loan space, um, the APLMA and the LMA in Europe, um, they're industry bodies, but they will not solve the issues for the lenders and borrowers. And I'll come on to talk about that in more detail shortly. Um, next slide, please. Now, I mean, this is an interesting one um, for Asia, the third point here. Um, because maybe this is more of an issue for Asia than maybe in Europe and the, and the US, certainly. Um, lots of different jurisdictions in Asia, lots of different currencies, lots of different reference rates, some, reference, some deals referencing LIBOR, some not. Um, different ways of dealing with the move to a risk-free rate in Asia amongst jurisdictions. So it's a much more complicated um, fact pattern um, in Asia. So. Um, the timing issues around that, when some rates may stop, transition, what they do, um, is something that is going to develop over the next sort of 12 months. Um, so that's a particular issue for Asia in the loan space. And then the fourth point, I think you've heard it from numerous speakers, um, it's happening, um, there's not much time left. Um, you can't really postpone your decision making. Um, but in the loan space, if you're lending, um, there are a few ways in which you can look at prioritizing um, certain types of transactions. Um, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so I mean, this slide and the next slide is now a talk all on its own. Um, so 
any of the issues you want further information about, please feel free to get in touch. But what I'm going to try and do is bring them out, but talk about what we're seeing lenders and borrowers do at the moment to deal with them. Um, so the real development in the loan space has been um, through the documentation and a publication of what was called the exposure draft by the APLMA and the LMA. Um, and then last week, um, there was a new document published um, called a, a rate switch without observational shift revolving credit facility. Um, a little bit of a mouthful, but I'll talk about that as well, because I think that's quite a significant development. Um, and that plays into whether as lenders and borrowers, you want to use the fallback language because the situation may have changed there. Um, so just on the left hand side there, um, what are these? Um, why is it an exposure draft? Well, the LMA and APLMA published these documents um, that the exposure draft, original exposure draft had input from the documentation committees, had input from the borrower association, the corporate treasurer side. Um, so the issues are there and thought through, but the documentation points out the issues involved on loans for moving to a risk-free rate. Um, Jing has gone through what a risk-free rate is and how that compares to your forward-looking rate. So I won't go into too much detail on that, but what the LMA said and the APLMA said is, here's the document. These issues are not for us to resolve. That's what the market needs to revolve, uh, resolve. So that point on the previous slide about don't think people are going to solve the issue for you um, is made crystal clear. Um, so these are exposure drafts, not recommended documents. And if you look at them, the idea of you know, loan agreements, syndicated loan agreements, and in particular, you know, doing a forward looking rate, set interest periods, the idea that everybody is funding themselves in the interbank market, um, even if they're not, that's the way the syndicated loan agreement works. Um, and that's how all the interest is calculated through that document. Um, and I was, I was thinking earlier today, um, I, I've been at Cliff Chance um, a very long time. And um, when I first started, the person in London that drafted the first syndicated loan um, was still working at Cliff Chance. Um, Admittedly, he'd been up to a chance a long time. So I think our, us both being there a long time meant we overlapped slightly. Um, but really that concept in the loan agreement has not changed. Um, loan agreements have developed, but the fundamentals around forward-looking interest periods, interbank funding has been around for decades. So moving to a backward-looking rate, which is overnight, um, is a fundamental shift in how the loan agreement works. Now, that comes back to a point on the previous slide about awareness. And what we're really seeing is engagement with um, borrowers and some lenders as well, um, understanding the consequences of that change um, is not uniform in the market. So engagement is crucial. There's not a lot of time. And so the understanding of where we're going and the consequences for loan documentation and how loans work is really important. So if we think about that from the borrower side, for example, um, treasurers are used to looking at the beginning of their interest period and knowing what interest they're going to pay at the end of it. You're going to a risk-free rate, backward looking, based on overnight rates, compounded daily perhaps, which I'll come back to. So you only know your interest burden at the end of the interest period that immediately gives a headache for treasurers because do they do a calculation and some assumptions and set cash aside? Do they ask lenders to pay interest slightly after the end of the interest period? Do you change the way the interest period um, actually works to avoid that issue? So some fundamental discussions um, that are currently um, taking place. Um, so that would all be solved if we have a forward looking term rate. Now, the point here, I think, is the message from regulators is lenders and borrowers in the loan space should not think and wait for a forward looking term rate to solve all the issues with going to a backward looking risk free rate. Um, you might find out that rate forward looking term rate doesn't materialize in time um, or not at all by the end of next year. Um, so 
it really is the case of lenders and borrowers having to get to grips with the issues now um, and deal with them. Um, so really that's why that documentation was published because the engagement was not great in the loan space. Since it's been published, we've moved along uh, leaps and bounds. Very quickly on the right hand side, I've talked about the issues. Well, I mentioned there the interest period. Do you shift it backwards slightly so it ends five days perhaps or three days or 10 days before the interest payment date? Um, do you calculate interest but stop five days before the interest payment date and assume the same rate for the last five days? These are all in that document and there's a very comprehensive note that uh, Clipper Chance did that explains all of these. The adjustment spread issue, which has been mentioned by Jing, so I won't go through that again, but clearly relevant um, to lenders and borrowers in the loan space. <coughs> Just on that, <coughs> one thing to think about is, do you build the adjustment spread into the margin so you still charge margin plus the risk-free rate, or do you charge margin risk-free rate plus the adjustment spread? so that everything is transparent. Um, question around compounding, lots of different ways to do that. Um, that is one of the hot points um, in the loan space. And I think there's a talk later um, from Ian Y that talks about hedge accounting. And um, you know, things like a mismatch between compounding in the loan space and on your hedging um, is a relevant consideration. Fallbacks I'll talk about on the next slide. Break costs. Um, Break costs are fine with a forward looking rate. We're all comfortable with why that's there. Um, conceptually, is that still relevant? Um, a discussion point in that document. Um, I'd say that where we've got to in the loan space uh, on all those points are the key ones that uh, are a focus of discussion and negotiation on transactions are lag period and the adjustment spread and compounding. Um, probably adjustment spread um, surprisingly, um, maybe is uh, the third least important out of those three um, at the moment that's been discussed on transactions. Um, the others seem uh, less important on the transactions that we've been seeing. Um, I could go to the next slide, please. Okay, so the exposure drafts, they're there. They are helping for new transactions. Um, so that's all great. But of course, we've got legacy transactions that we've already got there. Um, and Jing has talked about in the derivative space about fallback wording um, and how the derivatives world is going to work. And of course, in the loan space, we've got um, the LMA, APLMA fallback wording as well. Um, <clears throat> I just say just on the left hand side here, um, there's a number of ways in which you can deal with fallbacks. Um, so the Alternative Reference Rate Committee um, in the US, there's a sort of a hard wiring approach, which is uh, much more regimented, much more, it says, these are the steps, this is where you end up, pretty much. LMA, APLMA approach to fallbacks and their standard wording um, is an amendment approach. So you've got that idea that also Jing referenced that you've got various steps that will trigger that provision. So if one of those events happen, um, then you trigger the provision and there's a discussion around what amendments you need to make to the loan documentation to deal with the move to the risk-free rate um, environment. Um, so now that obviously has um, some issues around uncertainty because you have to have a negotiation. Um, and as, as I've mentioned on a previous slide, there are some slightly tricky and um, involved issues there um, that are not necessarily easy to go through um, with every lender and every borrower. Um, you know, a borrower may say, well, um, this was all caused by the banks, so why should I pay for it? And of course, the lenders will probably say that this is a market issue. Um, and actually, the way the markets look at it is borrowers are picking up the cost of the amendments. Now, that's a discussion on every transaction to be had. So that's just one example of where do not assume that because you have the exposure draft document that gives you some of the drafting, that if you've got LMA and APLMA fallback wording, it's going to be a very easy um, discussion and redocumentation process. Now, of course, you may be sitting in some legacy transactions where you don't have 
um, any fallback wording. Now, depending on how the documentation is worded, that might be fine because you might fall back to cost of funds. But cost of funds, it, usually in the loan context, that's only really meant to be there as a short term fix um, if the rate disappears. It's not meant to be a, a long term fix. And I'm not sure many agents on large syndicated facilities are going to be happy um, to sit long term in a cost of funds environment, um, and nor would the borrower. Um, given the time constraints, the, the middle column, I'm not really going to say too much about. Um, it just really picks up that idea about timing. So I've already mentioned multi-currency facilities. You may have uh, rates that are moving at different paces. Um, <clears throat> and then the, the possibility of value transfer at the bottom we've already mentioned. So talked about that. We've got a document that gives us some drafting. We all know what the issues are. So really, what are we seeing in the market as a result of that? Well, we've moved from lagging behind the derivative space to catching up a bit. We're now seeing transactions being done. So bilateral SORA transactions um, being done in Singapore. We've seen uh, bilateral software loans being done, Sonia facilities being done. Um, and I've referenced there the Royal Dutch Shell facility, which was a large syndicated facility. Um, done referencing SOFRA. Um, so we're starting to see transactions done. Um, based on, I would say, um, the drafting in the exposure drafts, um, the bilateral ones are probably, my guess would be, um, large borrowers testing the market, lenders wanting to try and build up um, awareness um, in their home markets around those risk-free rate uh, loan products. Um, then the bottom uh, bottom right hand side, I think is very important. So in the UK market precedence, um, <clears throat> what we're now seeing is what's been called um, a, a switch mechanic. Um, so this transaction for British American Tobacco, uh, again, a large syndicated facility, what that does is it's written off LIBOR, but at certain trigger events, it switches into the risk-free rate. Um, now, rather helpfully, this document is actually um, filed with the SEC um, in the US. So you can go on the SEC website and get this, this documentation, uh, this facility agreement, um, <coughs> and see how that switch mechanic works. Now, I say this is important because if you enter into a facility agreement now that works off LIBOR and has a switch to the risk-free rate, but that facility agreement already has the clauses for the risk-free rate to work, what you've done is eliminated that uncertainty if you're relying on um, fallbacks. Obviously, that's not going to help you for your current legacy transactions, but writing new loans now with a tenor that goes past the cessation of LIBOR at the end of next year, you could either go for the fallback route, which gives you that uncertainty and the need to renegotiate the documentation terms um, now fairly not not too far away from when you sign that document or you could go for this switch mechanic route um, which takes that away because it should deal with that switch and not need amending to the extent it did the amendments are likely to be very minimal and mechanical um, now I said a couple of slides ago one of the important things we're seeing in the loan market is those disclaimers um, to make the borrower aware on mandate letters and term sheets that this event is happening. Now, there's a question, I guess, you either go for the disclaimer on your term sheet and the fallback language because that's easier now, but the borrower has to understand you go for a renegotiation, or you could think about this type of switch document, but what that does mean is a little bit more pain now, perhaps in bringing the, that particular borrower up the curve on understanding the process, the issues, a bit more hassle in negotiation now, a bit more cost now. Um, so there's going to be pain either way, I think, in the loan market. Um, but that is one option to be able to take the pain now and not renegotiate potentially. Um, if we could go to the next slide. Okay, I'll run through the next two very quickly um, because of, because I'm sort of running up against the time now, but that was all the context of what we're seeing on loan documentation for new deals, 
loan documentation for legacy deals, loan documentation for mandate letters, term sheets. Um, the next two slides are really about what we're seeing with our financial institutions um, sort of internally and what they're now doing in looking at their loan products um, and what they have. Um, so some of these themes, again, have been touched on already, but I'll go through them very quickly and sort of give some insights into what we're doing and, and what we're seeing our clients doing. Um, so I mentioned awareness last three to six months has really ramped up in the loan space. Um, and that's very much the case internally for financial institutions. Um, seeing a lot more um, RFPs about um, IBOR, LIBOR transition, repapering exercises, um, and those processes getting started. Um, the first point I think I'll make just very quickly on this short term scoping the issue. Clearly, you can't repaper or work out what you need to do with your loan book um, unless you know what's in it. Um, so, unfortunately, um, I think the, the, the quote um, from one of the presentations earlier was about sort of a uh, um, the loans not being that difficult, most loans not being that difficult, um, but the process maybe repapering um, and internal sort of IT processing um, being a bit tedious. Unfortunately, there will be a big due diligence exercise needed, um, and those are already getting underway um, with, uh, with our clients looking at their loan book. Again, what loans do we have, which are bilateral, which are syndicated, do they have fallbacks? If they have fallbacks, what type of fallback? Um, now, I mentioned before um, on the previous slides, how much work you need to do may differ from transaction to transaction. If you're agent on a syndicated loan, you've probably got quite a bit of work to do um, in relation to the transition to the risk-free rate. Um, if you're a lender in the syndicate, you need to understand what's in that transaction but actually driving that process forward is probably, you can be a little bit passive. Um, that work can be done by the agent and, and the MLAs on the, on the transaction or when it was done. So there's a question about strategy um, that financial institutions can, can take and think about. Um, not every transaction um, needs the same amount of work um, and effort. Just at the bottom there, um, it was mentioned before, but risk management, um, that's been a real focus for our clients at the moment. Um, so one of the issues there is when you've done the diligence on your loan book, um, treating borrowers, treating equivalent borrowers in the same way. Um, so that's a very big issue and a very big consideration. Um, you know, this is uh, something that all lenders um, need to really have at the forefront of their mind. Um, if we could just whiz to the next uh, slide, that would be great. So then finally, I mean, left hand side, external communication, really important. Um, it's really ramped up in the last three to six months um, in the loan space is our experience. Lots more engagement, but it really needs to keep going. Um, the middle one, implementation of new contracts. I can't emphasize this enough. Just keep aware of the developments. Now, we've had that switch document come out last week. Um, I suspect that's going to develop as well um, over the next few months. Um, so there was, I think the loan space was a little bit slow because everyone was, was trying to wait and see which way the market was jumping on those issues in the exposure draft. Now we've had transactions building. Now we've got the switch documentation. I think that's just going to accelerate. So I think you know, just keep on, on top of what's happening in the market on documentation in the loan space, what the APLMA and the LMA um, are continuing to develop. And then finally, really important um, consideration for lenders, and we're having these discussions with them all the time, um, determining your preferred implementation strategy for your loan book. Um, do you amend transactions? Some you will have to. Um, do you refinance them? Um, it may with some borrowers be much easier just to refinance the existing facility um, with a risk-free rate facility rather than go through an amendment process? Um, or do you just do nothing? Um, if your fallbacks are satisfactory, maybe you can do nothing. If your bilaterals have a fallback uh, where you can determine an alternative rate, 
then maybe you can do nothing other than serve notice. All I would say on that is prior engagement very early with the borrower to discuss the issues will be really important. Um, so it really comes back to diligence in your loan book um, and then bucketing what you have and determining your strategy um, based on those considerations. Um, and then the next slide I won't talk about, it's just a conclusion summary of really everything I've spoken about. So I'd say loan space, we've really caught up. The documentation is really developing. We've got settled positions on a lot of the issues in the loan documentation. We've now got the switch document. So I personally think we might see that overtake for new transactions, the fallback wording um, over the next few months. So lots of development in the next six months, I think, um, in the loan space. And then I'll, I'll hand back. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. That was really helpful. Um, we are running behind and I apologize to the audience for that. Um, we are going to answer your Q&As either in the chat or we'll produce a formal question and answer document. So please keep sending them, although we don't have time to stop and an answer them right now, but we will get to them. So please, please continue to use the Q&A function. Now I'm going to turn it over to Edmund Lee from Bloomberg, who's going to give us an overview of IBOR transition data and infrastructure. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, you're able to hear me? Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, on behalf of Bloomberg, we thank ASIFMA for giving us the uh, opportunity to share Bloomberg's uh, expertise and areas that our clients have raised, especially on data and infrastructure needs for supporting benchmark transition and handling the RFR instruments. From Bloomberg's perspective, a benchmark reform has uh, three key components, uh, and it is uh, data, infrastructure, and communications. These are interconnected uh, components uh, which require continued awareness and action in the plans for light bulb transition. Over the last few years, we have been working with the uh, official and private uh, sectors on data and system requirements, including with ISTA, where Bloomberg is a fallback adjustment provider, while working closely with our regulators and clients on how robust data solutions, technology-driven automation will be fundamental to a successful transition away from LIBOR. LIBOR touches many financial instruments across many markets. It is helpful to distinguish the key differences. In the bilateral OTC directives of world, for example, documentation is defined mostly via the ISTA, master agreements and definitions. In the cash flow, for legacy issues over the past decades, fallback language is not only vague and disparate across issuers, but in many cases, it is missing entirely. Given the magnitude of what is required, participants should consider what changes are needed. In my presentation, I will explain how data and system infrastructure fit into the transition preparation process. Now, in this slide that we are looking now, we have about 15 months left until LIBOR becomes unusable. Participants need to accelerate transition efforts. So recognizing this need, the ARC has developed recommendations with date based guidance on the near-term transition steps that they believe market participants should take. In setting up these recommendations, the ARC also recognizes that there are contingencies that need to be satisfied for particular timelines to be met. For example, the ARC is working to revise recommendations for hardwire fallback language in business loans and working to develop recommended conventions that can be used by third party vendors for business loans. In this ARC recommended timeline and milestone slide, the ARC's guidance also highlights a date based approach surrounding near term transition steps it believes should be taken. Uh, we have marked two key columns which would impact the audience and suggested actions from there. If you look at the yellow triangle and now look at the column down, uh, that would be checking in with your data and technology vendors for their LIBOR readiness timetable. Now in the uh, orange uh, mark uh, triangle in the column uh, down, for data and uh, technology vendors to be ready for the milestones, for data and infrastructure systems to work on new conventions and transition activities for products in this column. Uh, next slide, please. So 
for upcoming milestones, two significant milestones coming this year are ISDA's finalization of the fallback methodology for OTC contracts um, and the release of final parameters for benchmark fallback adjustments for derivatives. And then after that, you have the shifting of discount curves at the CCPs for clear derivatives. This will be important for embedding SOFA within the derivatives market and driving liquidity in SOFA products. Dealers usually hedge their discounting liabilities, the switch to SOFA discounting, and PI, price alignment interest, is expected to create additional trading in SOFA overnight index swaps and SOFA futures. Finally, Regulatory guidance when LIBOR should cease to be linked in cash products in 2021. Now, to facilitate these milestones, we see that some market participants have implemented action plans to address the large-scale implications for the benchmark transition activity, including on operating model, data, technology. As changes evolve at different phases and at different speeds, the magnitude of system building can be huge. So let me highlight that here are some points surrounding technology. You need to come up with resources to implement a governance framework to oversee the delivery and coordination of the firm's enterprise-wide LIBOR transition program. Clients would also need to establish an enterprise-wide program to evaluate and mitigate the risk associated with transition with considerations for unique product and client exposures. They also need to start work on redesigning and transitioning the existing portfolio of LIBOR products, including creating or using new products based on SOFA. And lastly, develop and implement a firm-wide strategy with clear objectives to engage, communicate, and increase levels of education with impacted internal and external shareholders. Next slide, please. The benchmark transition process impacts multiple work streams simultaneously in all clients' um, uh, firms. We, engage, we advise our customers to adopt a holistic approach in assessing the impact of transition in order to identify gaps in their existing system infrastructure, the requirements of new data sets, as well as quantifying the impacts from a valuation perspective through eight different areas. This slide shows you the first four work streams that we have identified where technology will help facilitate the transition process. The first work stream impacts front office trading. Ensuring your front office can handle trading of new instruments referencing the new RFLs, as well as explaining the economic impact to both your customers and internal stakeholders. The second focuses on operation sites of things. Can your system handle daily compounding interest, calculating cash flows, or evaluate the impact of price alignment interest of your IRS trades independently? The third, focus on contracts. You have to identify all LIBOR link exposures, ascertain what fallback provisions are written in the contracts, and possible legal complexity in renegotiating your legacy contracts. The fourth focuses on regulatory compliance. Are you able to time your internal transition plan to match the timeline set by the regulators? Like, for example, inclusion of hardwired fallback provisions or cease referencing to LIBOR for new trades after a specific uh, timeline. While we will leave the contract negotiation to the lawyers, effective technological should enable quick mapping for fallback languages in contracts by classifying securities based on type of fallback provisions and be prepared before possible renegotiation takes place. Next slide, please. The next slide uh, continues on the next uh, fifth to eight uh, uh, business area. The fifth focuses on the treasury and funding operations, as you will need to switch the basis of your short-term funding and hedging to the new RFLs. Now, the next area is where most of our clients have difficulty with, which is in the area of valuation and market risk. Now, as we switch from a LIBOR discounting 
to the new RFR discounting regime, you will need to ensure that your system can handle pricing and calculation of risk exposures under both discounting bases. The last two areas focuses on accounting, finance, and IT infrastructure. Once you have identified the valuation impacts, you will also need to consider the downstream flows. That is if systems mentioned can handle outputs from your pricing systems, given that they are calculated in different interest rates basis. In all, new data and conventions creates a wide spectrum of risk for market participants across all business areas. Next slide, please. Now, as a solution provider, Bloomberg focuses on the data and infrastructure side of LIBOR transition, where we develop our system architecture as consensus on market conventions converges. Uh, here's a snapshot of the uh, areas around our data and infrastructure that Bloomberg has been working on our customers for their transition work. This covered the transition challenges the industry faces, how to make the tangible start, and where to locate information to enable analysis around LIBOR transition. So in the data segment, firstly, you need to find information on RFR securities, LIBOR disc discontinuation, and fallback data points across derivatives, and cash, and relevant technical documents, the liquidity of the new contracts. In the infrastructure side, effective rates for overnight indices, pricing of RFR instruments, the valuation impact, and the electronic uh, trading parts uh, are the key areas around infrastructure. Now, data infrastructure can help give a practical start and will provide answers to common questions around preparations for the shift and risk free rates. Uh, slide seven, please. Here's an example uh, of the uh, coverage under the uh, data cat category, as covered by Jane uh, from uh, ETA earlier. Uh, that would be the next slide, um, really. Now, ETA is implementing uh, adjusted versions of the RFRs to serve as eyeball for backs. ESA has selected a Bloomberg as the official adjustment service vendor. The adjustments include compounding in arrears calculation to align with eyeball term structures, a five-year median spread calculation, and the all-in fallback for 11 eyeball currencies. Uh, that would be the next slide, uh, uh, please. We also recommend that our users also refer to the rule book for incise details around LIBOR for bank data. Having the necessary data and calculators in place would help give you the what if scenarios as you map out the where and what components that you need to make changes. Next slide, please. How will data sets specific to transition be impacted? RFR data sets are available today, and simulations on scenarios need to be started with a view that over the next 15 months, RFR derivatives will evolve as liquidity finds its way to appropriate instruments. From Bloomberg's perspective, we currently construct our curve utilizing SOFA futures plus a blend of SOFA basis codes that represents market liquidity. However, as liquidity is expected to shift to SOFA OIS, this may evolve. This means that infrastructure needs to be flexible to accommodate data evolution and the ability to handle multiple benchmark regimes. Another example, that ESTA and SOFA as the new RFRs, the issue of non-centrally cleared instruments traded under credit support annexes, CSAs, will evolve. There is an expectation that CSAs will be amended to replace Fed funds with SOFA in the run-up to the end of 2021. This, in turn, has a follow-through on interest rate VOS data and behavior on the infrastructure around derivatives pricing. This means that systems need to capture all necessary attributes for pricing models to run simulations to understand how to minimize economic impact on collateral prior to and after CCT price alignment migration. This would be an area of preparedness to work to be done 
to meet the October pie shift uh, milestone. Next slide, please. The next question surrounds the necessity of identifying fallback languages for cash-based securities, given that there's less standardization compared to the derivatives market. When you are dealing with a large inventory of legacy trades, it will be impossible to eyeball and identify these provisions manually. Instead, you should look for a solution that enables a systematic scanning of such provisions in automatic fashion. It is important to proactively monitor possible changes to forward provisions by observing how other similar issuers adopt or changes their provisions and fallback language so that you are in a better position to analyze if the new fallback proposed is deemed practical and acceptable. Apart from this, transition for legacy loans is on its way to being finalized with the Fed Arc's recent guidance and the RFPs for vendors' calculation works on fallbacks and spread adjustment. Systems would also need to handle different calculation interest rate conventions as recommended by various jurisdictions. Next slide, please. So, in summary, this is Bloomberg Take on the three key areas of benchmark transition. A granular look at how data and infrastructure program should include a framework to monitor industry progress, timelines, and actions. In the data area, Fallback data for derivatives and cash exists today. RFR curves data and the ability to run quality control for consistency and running it through prices and models across departments in a firm can be started today. What remains is for a firm to start testing and implementing it to production. With that on data, Systems can start work on scenarios and impact analysis. There will be downstream impact on CSA collateral and big data. Infrastructure needs to be open to tackle multiple rate regimes and a host of known conventions and unknown not yet resolved uh, today. This would require investment on multiple levels. However, feedback from regulators in other jurisdictions is that many participants have started work and making progress in transition activities. As work in data and infrastructure takes place, we have effectively 15 months or lesser if we are to have our clients ready for transition by the end of Q2 next year. We have to start the communication process. In client communications and disclosures, active market engagement and monitoring can run concurrently. As it is possible to now start continuous engagements with clients on risks, your plans, and economic change preference. In our journey on LIBOR transition, there will be many components that you will need to address. As we cope with the many cha changes, we encourage you to examine your data infrastructure readiness. And having this tool in place could at least provide you with a tangible start while navigating through the details and technicalities that continue to be developing. On that note, thank you for your time. Any questions, please do not hesitate to reach out. We look forward to working in the industry and together towards a smooth transition. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Edmund. Um, now I'm pleased to invite you all to uh, our banking panel on implementation issues. We have um, three uh, panelists, Kevin Yam from Deutsche Bank, Jacob Abraham from Maybank, and Tech Pio Prof from Standard Charter. And uh, welcome everyone to use the chat. Um, if we can incorporate questions, we will. Otherwise, we'll answer them at the time that we're doing on time. Um, so so let, let's start off. Uh, let's start off this panel, and I think our first question is, what are banks in Malaysia doing to get ready for IBOR transition? Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank, thank you, Rebecca. Thank you for the invitation uh, to be part of this webinar. Uh, if I could just share the Maybank journey. Um, I think uh, in 2017, when uh, FCA initially kind of got the ball rolling about uh, LIBOR transition, 
Maybank, like many other banks, took a, a wait and see approach. Uh, the lack of clarity at the time, uh, probably one of the main reasons. Uh, I think at that time, if you would have asked 10 people how they would run LIBOR transition, you probably would have gotten 10 different answers. Uh, but, but as an organization, I think uh, collectively, uh, we had our, what I call a, our oh my God uh, moment uh, somewhere around the uh, middle of uh, 2019. And clearly some banks had their moment before us and some after, um, but I think the, the, the scale uh, of what needed to be done, the, the enormity and the complexity of it is probably what drove us. And, uh, you know, clearly this is not just a problem for the front office. This is the front, the middle, the back. This is not just one or two lines of business, but cuts across the organization, uh, our insurance arm, uh, investment banking, uh, and Maybank, uh, being that we have presence in, in uh, many countries, uh, it's, it's not just a Malaysian problem. We, we obviously had to also deal with it uh, across the, uh, all our geography uh, locations. Now, I think um, I'll probably just share three main things that we tackled uh, when we wanted to start the journey. I think the first, the first thing that we had to tackle obviously was sponsorship. Who's going to drive this project in your organization? I think that must be very clear. We decided uh, at the onset that uh, a business unit and an assurance function uh, should be driving this. So we had a co-sponsorship program between uh, Global Banking and Group Risk. Um, and the second issue then is governance. Um, we must have clarity on your governance framework because uh, some, some people say that this is uh, you know, the largest financial engineering project the world has ever seen. Um, so clearly the board needs to get involved. The question is how, how do you make that connection? Um, so for us, we set up a project steering committee with the two sponsors. Uh, we also had uh, about seven uh, or eight additional EXCO members, uh, part of the, uh, of the PSC. And, uh, yeah, and clearly at this level now, you know, um, the changes just doesn't happen by chance. Uh, you know, this is not some miracle that from the middle of the organization, LIBOR transition will somehow just take place. So the, the tone from the top uh, is absolutely crucial uh, to make this work. Um, the third area is uh, execution. Uh, how, how, do you, how do you get the machinery moving? Uh, Mayor Bank's approach was clearly just to break it up into work streams. Uh, again, I think at the beginning, uh, I would, the analogy I would use is really trying to get, um, you know, fill up a, a cup of water with a fire hose. Uh, you know, the, the amount, of, amount of information that was out there was just significant. So we broke it up into smaller work streams. Um, so, for example, we had one work stream on accounting and finance. Uh, we had someone very senior from the uh, GCFO's or the CFO's office to drive this. Um, across, again, all the CFOs uh, across the organization, be it from business, be it from geography, uh, and to ensure that everybody was uh, connected uh, across that whole spectrum. Um, and similarly, we had uh, work streams on legal systems, uh, technology, operations. Um, but the point to highlight was that we really started as silos. Um, and again, I think on day one, nobody was a LIBOR transition expert. Uh, we needed everyone to really go back, uh, do their own research, get familiar, you know, talk to your peers, talk to, to industry uh, experts, what have you. At the end of the day, you must be in a position to be comfortable to come back, for example, to the PSE to articulate what is it that you need to do uh, uh, in your respective areas. And naturally, we evolved from the silo to what I would call a cross work stream type uh, discussion. So uh, it was started to get more task orientated in that sense. Um, so you can't, you know, for example, you can't go and see a client and, and just talk to him about, you know, accounting and finance or taxation. Uh, you need to talk to him about legal, you need to talk to him about products and, and what have you. So again, uh, you know, uh, the, the natural evolution that took place was in that order. Um, so I guess in summary, uh, when you, as you start the transition or as, as you kind of ride the, the, the that wave, uh, the question is, we have clarity and sponsorship, governance, and uh, take it in bite-sized pieces uh, is probably what I have to say. Thank you.
And how does that work with what's going on at Standard Charter? Um, thanks, Rebecca. Hi, this is Jack Bell from Standard Chartered. So it is it is quite a similar, I would say, um, journey. I think our journey started slightly earlier. So I think the starting sort of point, as Jacob mentioned, was the FCA speech of 2017. Uh, I think being a UK headquartered bank, we we certainly we certainly got the message, and I think plans started to um, we started to look at. What we need to do, and and really started to put in place, uh, I think the mechanisms, the people, um, and, and things like this. And I think it really kicked into high gear. Um, I think some of you might be aware, uh, the UK FCA and the PRA actually uh, essentially gave a, a DSTO letter to major UK firms uh, in the September of 2018, um, and that definitely got um, LIBOR transition into high gear for a lot of UK firms, um, including ourselves. So in terms of the organization setup, I will not speak, um, I think, more to what Jacobs mentioned, um, in the sense that for us, uh, it's, it's slightly different. Um, I think the common areas Jacobs mentioned, for us, slightly different. Uh, I, I do share the view on governance, um, and in the UK, as I think, uh, some of our colleagues know we do have a senior managers regime. So as part of that regime, um, we do have an identified senior manager who oversees um, the the I think level transition program at uh, in, as part of his uh, responsibilities. So, so I think that a few key points that I would make I think echoing some of the things that Jacob said. So having that proper governance, having that proper setup, I think within the organization, um, especially. If um, you do have LIBOR running through various parts of your business, uh, especially for ICE, I think that's going to be key. Um, for us, we also have a central program um, that is run by an accountable executive looking across um, the level transition uh, pen bank, uh, pen business. And then you have the different business extremes in place that will run um, the level transition for their business on a global basis. Uh, I think a few key things that I think we found to be, I think, important slash uh, I think key to the process is uh, to have really good, um, I think, grabs of all your exposure to LIBOR. Um, I think for Jacob and for ourselves, we do have LIBOR sitting in multiple businesses. Uh, so and so, I think it's key that that the bank or the firm has that ability to to really get data on your exposures, whether it's in home country like Malaysia or across all your branches and subsidiaries that are outside Malaysia. And having all this, uh, I think, easily retrievable and then I think regularly updated and managed. So I think that's one key thing, exposure data. Um, second is, I think, the whole part on change and client engagement. So change is, obviously, we do see um, a lot of change related areas in the bank um, that is needed so how that is run i think is going to be key cutting across systems uh training plan outreach i think that's that's the second area i think the third area i think jacob alluded to it is uh, we uh, i think ahead of the um i think is the protocol as jing mentioned and some of the loans work as um as the apla mentioned um there is going to be a fair bit of uh, client engagement, client outreach, and client education to do. Um, and then subsequently, a lot of bilateral conversations with clients about their LIBOR exposure and what they want to do with the LIBOR exposure. So I think having that client engagement focus and priority uh, to make sure that clients are kept updated about what's going on, I think that's going to be, um, at least for, for financial institutions, that's going to be another key area uh, to think about and to organize our to organize ourselves into because as we go into the repapering and repricing part of, of the discussions towards the end of this year and from next year, I this will increasingly be, I think, a focus for, for both um, regulators as well as um, our clients. Rebecca? So if I'm a client of your bank, what can I expect from you? Like what, what's going to happen? I, say I have a loan, mm. what should I be doing? Yeah, so I think that, that's a great question and I think it's, it's a timely question because of, I think, where we are in the transition process. So we are, I think, I, I think most of us, at least from the banking side, um, would echo what the FCA has said in the sense that we are now in a pretty critical phase of the transition. Um, I think the FCA mentioned that quite recently. Um, a few reasons. First, we 
got the Easter protocols, uh, I think, about to, to be launched as things updated. Uh, we've got the milestones on incorporation of fallbacks into new loan documents and a new, loan, new and refinance loans, at least in the UK, as well as the US, coming up. So, so I think, and then obviously, yes, in, um, in October of this year, we've got the discounting switch at the CCP for dollars. So we are at a, at a critical phase. And from a client perspective, I think what we've done, and I, I, would, I would suspect what um, uh, Maybank and others have done is, um, there's been a, a bad bit of comps in terms of making sure that clients are aware of what's going on. So I think giving background on LIBOR, giving, um, I think, uh, updates fairly regularly on what's going on with LIBOR, what's going on with the, the fallbacks, what's going on with the new LIBOR markets. So these updates, um, I think for us, we've put uh, a fair bit of um, our resources um, into uh, a website. So we've got a public website that's accessible via the standard charter page um, for clients in terms of getting, I think, regular updates on what's going on with LIBOR transition there. So that's one. Um, second, as I've mentioned, plan emails. Um, I think that's the second. Third is that before that, um, before before the restrictions of COVID, we've got um, we've got in person seminars, in person meetings. Um, now we we are sort of I think COVID's been one sort of changer in the sense that we've we have shifted to a lot of virtual events because of all the business restrictions in the country. And obviously, uh, lastly, working with uh, closely with Pacifica, who's been really helpful in terms of getting out to to um, a lot of our our uh, clients to make sure that. They are, they are, um, I think, continually be updated. So on the bank side, we've also developed a checklist so that complements what's was done. Uh, the checklist covers a number of things. Is that uh, we've sent this checklist to clients, essentially, is for clients to have a look about, have a look at, um, and have to think about really what it is, what they need to do um, to make sure that they are as prepared as they can. So I'll just highlight a few things. Again, exposure. Look at how exposures are. Um, are in your in your in your company. I think that's key. Um, second, I think for a lot of our corporate clients, right, um, they are using loans. They are using derivatives to hedge, for example, or they are they are using derivatives to hedge their issued bonds. So how accounting and tax hedges work? Um, I think that's going to be key for the clients to have a good discussion um, with the likes of EY and their professional advisors. Um, last but not least, um, I think for clients to also really keep aware and updated from your bankers on what's the development in the risk free rate market so that they can actually start to think about whether they should, um, I think, transact in those markets once they've understood that they're ready to transact in those markets. Because from a transition perspective, it's going to be really difficult for a client to, to jump from LIBOR into the RFR space without that um, obviously going through the journey of figuring out how the RFR works and perhaps trying out a few small transactions uh, to make sure that their own systems, their own sort of uh, processes are working. So, so the checklist has a few of these things uh, that essentially sets out a, a list of stuff for clients to think about what they should do. And then last but not least, uh, as we go into the, the last quarter of this year, we've, I think for, for our perspective, we've, if you have a loan, you would have received um, an email about what our plans are in terms of engaging clients with global referencing loans. Yeah, that, that's really helpful. And, and Jacob, how does that work at your organization? Um, well, I, I think we're obviously we all take cognizance of uh, the Bank Nicara uh, uh, timelines uh, and signpost uh, document that came out in July. Um, so we, we, we've uh, planned it out accordingly. Um, plan engagement to me is very important. Uh, it's a, it's, and to me, it's actually a landmark uh, for this whole transition journey, because all this while, with the first phase has pretty much been very much uh, inward looking. Uh, it was all about us trying to fix our own processes and so forth. So now that we start going out to the client and it's outward looking, it's really you know trying to put all those pieces together and all that work that we have done to see whether we can actually uh, help to solve the problems of uh, you know of ourselves and for our clients. Uh, so this is really where, you know, as they say, the proof, proof is in the pudding. And, and this is really the, the time that we, we, we measure this. So it's a significant uh, component, I think, of the journey. Uh, for us, uh, we've also did, uh, I think, some of the uh, items that Ted talked about. You know, we have a website set up. Uh, 
uh, give to give the customers uh, you know a preliminary view of, of the transition uh, requirements. Uh, we have now, you know, obviously now reached out, started to reach out to our clients, and you know this is an ongoing process uh, in line again with the Q3 timeline from Magna Carta. Uh, and the, the whole idea is ultimately is to, um, uh, to sort out, you know, and 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 handle all all that is needed uh, by you know around Q2 or Q3 of next year. Um, so from a timeline point of view, this is uh, uh, we work closely uh, with that. I think. I think I, I'll probably another point I want to talk about uh, uh, at this point is really again about from uh, uh, the timing issue. I think this has been brought up many times. Uh, time is uh, really of the essence here. And I think for those who are behind, uh, you know, um, it is inevitable that uh, that you probably will need to get some external help, uh, especially, especially in areas like accounting, taxation, and so forth. And and um, uh, the other thing is. Clients should not forget the non-financial uh, contracts. Eyeball transition is not just about the financial contracts. Uh, please go through your contracts for, for example, with your IT vendors and stuff like that, because uh, you could have uh, LIBOR references in there as well. So, so be mindful of the non-financial contracts. Yeah, that's a great. That's a that's a great point. Um, what we, we've been discussing a little bit, what right, you're doing from a back office perspective. I mean, Kevin, do you want to sort of chime in and, and tell us how this is impacting your front office operations over at Deutsche? Hi. Uh, hi, Kevin. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, yeah, um, thanks, Rebecca. Um, I guess, you know, from a front office perspective, you know, clearly, uh, you know, a lot of being said uh, uh, throughout this course, right, uh, for the many speakers. Key is really being preparing early, right? I think um, um, we need to be prepared early and work within the transition groups, right? Uh, we have uh, centralized transition teams. I think from a front office perspective, is really aligning, right, uh, the transition plans, right, uh, to the centralized plans. But obviously, you know, every country will have a, a different um, uh, timelines. But I guess, you know, from uh, Bank Nagara signpost uh, perspective um, um, is a is a good standing point, right, for for Malaysia, right, uh, and, and broadly it aligns with a uh, um, major global transition roadmaps. That's key, right, uh, to have a plan around that, right, in terms of your positions. And two is really, you know, um, adhering to the ISDA coming upcoming ISDA protocol. I think key is um, uh, as interbank players. Um, uh, uh, we should adhere, right? Uh, and it's expectation that unilaterally most of our interbank dealers will adopt this this language. Um, I guess you know within the escrow period, uh, you know, post that uh, we'll probably know who who are our clients or who are our counterparties who are not on that on that protocol. Um, and the you know, key is for us to to post that post that uh, review to understand you know where 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 our portfolio is with our clients. And to have that negotiation, right? I think with, with interbank counterparties, it's it's assumed, right? Or it's, uh, it's agreed that most most adopt this uh, uh, protocol. Um, hence, I think uh, from a firm perspective, uh, after that we we'll probably have uh, an overview of our IBO exposures, right? Uh, where the pain points are. I guess a lot of it is down uh, from a derivative pers uh, positions. I think clearly. There is a plan to move forward. I think the pain points will come in the tough legacies. Uh, um, how do we identify the contracts that may be difficult to transition, etc. Right? Um, that's also key to us. And I think from an industry perspective, how do we move on is uh, uh, um, to de-risk our, our exposure uh, for um, bilaterally tearing up the CCS. I guess you know in the interim while we move towards the transitions, right? Or to to reduce our notional exposures in our books. And also, I guess, you know, a lot has been said about systems by admin in terms of, you know, our models, our risk models, uh, able to handle the, the pricing mechanics and the change, the shift in curves, and, and obviously the downstream impacts in, that impacts our valuation, our pricing models, and, you know, the changeover in terms of the uh, risk-free rate. And I guess the most important and the most crucial thing for us is the SOFA market development. And for a bank uh, to be ready to offer those products, right? Uh, currently, you know, the way we see it is, you know, the market isn't that developed, right? Uh, there is no real term structure um, in the market, despite the market having a futures market. LIBOR is still a dominant con contract, as you know, uh, through the, 
data that's been sent by ISDA, I think market volumes have kind of increased over the last couple of months on LIBOR contracts. But key is really, you know, to be ready uh, when the market is there. Um, and most, uh, and obviously, um, is uh, the the market is fairly developed in terms of the the basis swap, and it's hope right, you know, from the discounting switch. Um, most major players uh, uh, was uh, will start offering liquidity uh, in SOFA, right? Um, and the ARC is also expected to publish uh, forward-looking SOFA term rates in Q2. Um, and really, we 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 think uh, um, markets should develop, and we should be ready to offer uh, SOFA 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 uh, SOFA products to our clients. And I, I guess you know, actively considering legacy LIBOR contracts is also key to the migration of to the risk-free rate. Uh, um, we need to take stock of our existing positions, uh, reduce those uh, inventories, and, and through trade compressions or, or bilateral compressions uh, where possible. And the next thing is obviously uh, on, on the ringgit market, right? Uh, clearly, um, uh, Chu mentioned earlier that uh, CIMB and Stanchart uh, had a maiden trade, right? Uh, clearly, that is a step forward on, on the market development piece. Uh, uh, in terms of the Clybor and, and, and so far, how, the, how would the cross-currency develop? Um, that's with hope, right? Uh, eventually, eventually, the market would deepen, right? And, and many more players would, would engage in that, in that market. So, so, so that helps us uh, uh, facilitate our client transactions. Yep. Um. So, so just kind of following on from that, I mean, what what happens if there's if you have a cross currency product or a multi jurisdictional product? What do you do? Um, yeah, Sorry. maybe Rebecca, I, I, I okay, okay, maybe back. I can chime in to to what uh, Kevin says. So as as he's mentioned, um, I think Sun Chartered Malaysia, uh, we we did a first I think five ball of a uh, dollar ringgit cross currency swap. Um, and I think it's. I think this is a really I think interesting one because um I think Kevin alluded to it the the new world of how a RFR cross currency product works uh, I think that's going to be something that the industry is trying to work through so there are sort of conventions that have been recommended by ISDA um and also the ARC so I think that's one one area and obviously these conventions will still need to be tested and I think. I think Hoylan from from Eun Yang mentioned that um, for Malaysia especially, I think obviously a lot of banks like ourselves, um, Maybank, Doxia, I think we are here and we we do have we do support a lot of the key Malaysian entities, um, our corporate clients in their um, activities in exports and imports and. With that regard, right, for cross-currency products, whether they are used to hedge um, interest rates, um, investments, bonds, exposures, it is a key part of, I think, Malaysia, our Malaysia uh, the, the, the needs of our Malaysian clients, um, as well as, I think, clients in other jurisdictions in Asia as well, because cross-currency product is, is a pretty sizable um, piece that is, I would say, fairly unique because uh, we depend so much on dollars in uh, where other we have a lot of exposures in dollars uh, and do have a head of dollar, let's say onshore currency or, or currencies in, in other countries as well. So I think we've done the ringgit uh, dollar swap. I think we've, our Chinese entity has also done um, a, a software CNY swap, cross currency swap. And I think it, amongst the interbanks, I think as Kevin alluded to, I think we are starting to, to put together a few trades to see how the templates will work. Um, and then slowly sort of progress that. And I think over time, right, uh, for, for corporates that are ready to look at how this will work, I think approach your banks, approach your dealers, I think, I think we'll be happy to discuss how that structure will work and also take you through, uh, take you through the options that you have uh, in terms of, let's say, a new RFR swap on both legs or one leg, um, and also your legacy swaps. What, I think, uh, what you should be thinking about in terms of uh, um, your legacy swap, especially that you use to hatch, let's say a uh, a multi currency loan product. So I think that's still early days, but I think it's it's picking up and it's developing. It's certainly something that that Malaysia and I think other countries in Asia will need to to focus on, especially for the larger corporates that that have all these cross currency exposures. Well, thank you.
Um, I'm, I'm mindful of the time, so I want to just, I, I want to, but I have a question I really want to get all of your views on before we do close the panel. And that is, you know, as it relates to Malaysia, kind of what is your biggest worry about IBOR transition? And maybe, Jacob, we could start with you. Yeah, um, I, I think for me, uh, Islamic financing is probably an area of concern. Uh, I, we've discussed this already uh, at length uh, just now, probably. Um, and um, uh, at the end of the day, I mean, uh, we, we talk about the compounding and do have the concept of the ceiling rate, which I think uh, you know, addresses that issue to a certain extent. Um, I think when we talk about cross-jurisdictional uh, space, uh, you know, the alignment of that across uh, the jurisdictions is, is probably a, a gray area here. And I think um, uh, we need to have uh, that clarity. And I have not really seen any literature at a global level, um, you know, to try to provide that clarity uh, and resolution. Um, so our ability to go and see clients and talk about Islamic solutions is will be hampered. Um, and I think... Uh, Collectively, as an industry, I think uh, all stakeholders really need to, you know, kind of come together uh, to find this resolution. And it should be, you know, obviously sooner than uh, later. Uh, again, we talked about time. Uh, uh, we don't really have that much luxury anymore. Uh, so I think this is a big area, uh, definitely in Malaysia, that, that uh, we, we are working with, that we need to work on. Yeah, that's, a, that's an important point. Um, you know, Ke Kevin, do you have anything you'd want to add to that? Sorry, I uh, was muted. Uh, I guess, no, my, my observation is generally uh, pretty much uh, a general observation around um, the urgency, right? Obviously, with the FASB not postponing um, um, the IBO cessation, uh, the, the general feeling that the non-bank FI and corps readiness, you know, the focus tends to be very different, right? Given the COVID situation, and now we have a short and a compressed time frame, and to get you know, your firm totally focus on this over the next 15 months is crucial, right? So generally, it's really around the readiness. And two, I guess, you know, um, from a market's perspective, you know, generally, you know, we, we feel liquidity is developing, right? Uh, there is a progress forward, but really, um, we, need, we need clients to move, right? Before, you know, things start to kick in. Really, that client engagement needs to happen, right? So we need to, we need to be prepared early, right, to get, to get things moving. And generally, you know, don't wait till the end, right? And you need to be prepared, right? Otherwise, there will be a bottleneck impact. Uh, you know, late Q2, where everybody's rushing uh, to get things done, right? So I think key message is really, you know, we need to we need to start now, early. And Techpio, do you do you have any uh, thoughts that you want to share on that point? Yeah, I think one one area that um, that is something that, that we we do work on is. Um, as I think Aj Asna mentioned, um, Bank Negara has the signpost, and I think we are we are very uh, really glad that I think the signposts have aligned um, to what uh, essentially the ARC and the Sterling Risk Rate Working Group has set up as industry sort of aspirations, um, and also broadly sort of aligned to what the Hong Kong MA has put up. So, so for us, I think is is again to to really um, urge. The I think regulatory our key regulators like Bank Nagara um, and others to really continue the the dialogue uh, that that they are having with each other um, because there are also a lot of regulatory changes that are going to be affected by uh, liabilization and I think it is important uh, for uh, at least for banks uh, that the regulators continue that dialogue to make sure that um, timelines and all that are. are aligned and to the extent possible um, and also any consequential regulatory impact is is identified and then discussed uh, with the industry so i think then moving outside the regulatory side um, i think onshore in malaysia definitely to make sure that there is that that um i think uh, discussion with uh, between magnagara other regulators as well as um i think also bodies outside the um the, the financial regulatory world, so whether it's accounting or, or others, simply because uh, we do have so much impact that, that goes outside, um, as I think our UI colleagues have mentioned. Veronica? 
Well, that's that's really helpful, gentlemen. Thank you very much for for joining us um, and sharing your you know your practitioner experiences. I think it's really valuable um, to those on the webinar to hear what the banks are doing and 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 how and how they are going to respond as either counterparties or that they need to follow suit if they're a financial institution themselves. Um, now I'm going to turn over the webinar to uh, Ian Y, and they're going to present to us on local accounting issues, including fair value, value transfer, hedge accounting, and modifications. And we're going to be, um, we, we have the privilege of welcoming Damian Jones and uh, Ho Lam Chan back um, to speak about these issues. Hi, thanks, Rebecca. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Uh, it, it's always interesting when you wait uh, and you're the, the last presenter uh, and I can see the participants hopefully staying on, but a few dropping off. Uh, and I appreciate, uh, clearly it's important and great to hear from the banks. So uh, that was an important session. Uh, I, I'll keep this uh, at a very high level. We'll do a whistle stop tour of some of the, uh, some of the accounting impacts. Perhaps if we can uh, turn to the next slide, please. Uh, so, so I'll focus, and I'll keep this brief, as I say, ju just on accounting and valuation. And I think it has been mentioned, you know, one of the, the key requirements here is really to, to set up a good governance structure. It's pretty typical to see a finance and tax working group. Uh, and there are a number of issues to work through, including, you know, FTP, uh, pricing, valuation, as well as all of the, you know, hedge accounting and, and modification uh, concepts to, to work through. Uh, if we could uh, turn to the next slide. I'll quickly talk on valuation first before talking on accounting. And again, busy slide. Uh, the, 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 the two kind of key takeaways here are, one, clearly there is a valuation impact as we think about shifting discounting. Some of that will be imposed upon counterparties uh, through the process with the CCP shifting discounting, and I guess the principal one being Fed funds to, to SOFA uh, next month. Uh, in the uncleared market, clearly, you know, there, there's a concept where the banks will want to align cleared and uncleared pricing, and therefore that concept of working through your CSAs uh, to, to change your discounting, it does have an impact on valuation to, to think through. And, and then finally, you shouldn't forget your, you know, your wholesale corporate customers, which are typically uncleared, uncollateralized type of derivatives. And again, just thinking through wh when are you going to change the discounting for those? When are your counterparties going to change? Is that only going to happen at cessation date? Or, you know, are you, is liquidity going to start shifting ahead of that date? And I think that's an important concept here just as you, as you work through this process. Uh, the other call out on here is really around uh, for, for those derivatives that are captured under the ISDA fallback process, wh whether through the protocol or, or bilateral amendment, uh, I think people are turning their minds to this concept of pre-cessation. And obviously, uh, ISDA raised it earlier. But, but there's a, a, a real sort of uh, thinking point here just around, to the extent the FCA come out and there is a pre-cessation event ahead of cessation, so sometime uh, early next year, you know, what, what impact does that have on current valuation? Uh, so do, do you need to change your forward curve uh, g given cessation date will be known? And again, just working through the implications on both valuation and risk systems uh, certainly has got the banks thinking uh, across the globe. That's if we keep going. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, again here, lot, lots to take away. Uh, for, for me, I think it's important here that, you know, there's a number of subtopics within valuation to, to think through. Uh, as I said, just you know, fair value hierarchy, value transfer, you know, please don't forget CVA and, and FVA. There is a, 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 you know, a link here to, to how you run your, your valuations. So there's a, n a number of topics that will need to be thought through. I guess the other call out for me here is around curve construction. Uh, and I think this will just be, you know, an evolving process. So how do you build your sofa curve today? And will that be the same in any year's time? And I think just as the basis market, you know, changes, what will that do to valuation and pricing and curve construction as well? So uh, another thing to think through. 
perhaps if we if we keep going uh, again I'll, I'll talk very high level around accounting I think Kulam mentioned some good news in this space there are two phases to the work that the ISB has been doing the first came out last year around phase one that was really focused on on sort of pre-cessation so uh, making sure that hedge accounting can be continued at the current time uh, the work that has just been completed by the board and was released uh, last month really focuses on you know at the point of cessation uh, can you continue to apply hedge accounting uh, and some of the uh, reliefs that have been given are uh, certainly pretty positive uh, and I guess the call out there is uh, that new phase is uh, effective from 1 Jan 2021 but you can early adopt again if we continue with the next slide uh, I think this is a great uh, th this uh, s slide and the material in it isn't in the final materials that were released by the board and and actually some of the, the paragraph references are probably slightly wrong, but it's a, it's a great visual in terms of, you know, on a single page, what, what are the real implications on hedging and the, the interaction with derecognition. And so, again, without going through uh, a lot of detail here, it, it is important to understand, you know, does the modification, whether that's through a fallback, whether that's through the actual change and restructure to a new reference rate product, uh, you know, is that modification purely because of transition or as you go negotiate with your counterparties, uh, are they asking for other changes, whether they'd be extensions to term, changes in, uh, you know, covenants and, and other things that could change the, ultimately the pricing of that contract. Uh, and, and I think really the, the rub is, to the extent that it is purely a focus on uh, transition, then you know the practical expedients that have been set up in the standard will apply. To the extent there are other modifications and they are substantial in that contract, then unfortunately you still need to go through you know the existing uh, requirements in the standard that that focus on uh, you know a PL gain or loss uh, and potentially derecognition. So I think it's important that you know. Uh, and I think it was actually called out by Andrew earlier from, from Clifford Chance. Uh, these reliefs are very helpful, but fundamentally do not avoid the need for measuring in effectiveness if you have a fundamental mismatch between a cash product and a derivative. So I think it's important as we go through and think through negotiation that you take a holistic view of your positions and really think through the alignment or uh, you know, potential alignment between your derivative fallbacks and your cash contract fallbacks and when and how you're going to restructure those contracts. Uh, if we could turn to the final slide, please. Uh, and again, I've set out here, you know, there, there are a number of pathways to think through here, which ultimately will end up with some sort of accounting consequence. So you could close out or terminate your contract you could you know, immediately renegotiate to a risk-free rate. You could agree to a, a risk-free rate, but, but only through you know, a market protocol or bilateral negotiation, and that will kick in at the point of cessation. Or, or you could do nothing. Uh, and now that may you know, get you to a point where there's an existing fallback that works, or equally, you could end up with contract frustration. And so, you know, working through the accounting consequences of value transfer, of modification, of potentially provisioning for legal process, you know, all of these journeys need to be thought through. And I think, you know, again, echoing the messages from earlier in, in the day, I think just working through your strategy with the lawyers, with the business and thinking through, you know, what, what is fair and reasonable both for, for a bank and for its customers uh, and therefore, what are the you know, accounting and tax consequences off the back of that? Uh, I'll keep it short. Hopefully, uh, that, that's been helpful. Hulam, did you have any final closing comments to add? Thanks, Jeremy. Just two points. Uh, just a reminder to all of us in Malaysia. MFRS is the same as IFRS. So whatever that has been decided by ISP, we will apply here, uh, same timing, since we have fully adoption. We have the full adoption since 2012. Uh, then the final point is about disclosure. Um, 
the requirement and the new amendments into IFRS and MFRS will be effective in 2021. Uh, but I understand that some banks are thinking about uh, early adopting the disclosure part. Uh, in the amendment, there are disclosures required on the status of the IBO reform, uh, the impact, and then the risk involved. So, as I mentioned, really we need to disclose on in 2021, annual report 2021, but some banks are thinking about early adoption, even in their annual report in 2020, right, to be friendly, or to be helpful to the readers, the investors, some banks are thinking about disclosing some of this information required already in 2020. Just want to highlight this point. Thank you. Back to you, Rebecca. Well, I just like to ask the audience, I mean, please use your chat. We have ENY here. I know we ran over a little bit, but but if you do have a question for them, please feel free to um, f put it into the chat. Um, and if we don't have any questions, then I guess we can we can conclude. We'll conclude our webinar and, and we hope that you all found it helpful. Um, we'd like to thank all of our speakers. Uh, this was a really informative webinar and we appreciate all your time and attention in putting, in putting it together and it coming here today to speak to us. So over to you, Millie. Thank you again for joining us today. Our next virtual event will be on Tuesday, September 22nd, India Eyeball Transition. Please reserve your seat by either scanning this QR code on the screen or visiting our website, www.asifma.org events. We hope to see you there. Have a great day. Thank you.